Good morning and welcome to the 14th meeting in 2015 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Could I please ask everyone present to turn off any mobile phones uh, or other electronic devices. Uh, our first item of business today is to continue to take evidence as part of our inquiry into Scotland's fiscal framework. We hear from two sets of witnesses today. Uh, firstly, I would like to welcome to the meeting the following Scottish Government officials, uh, Mary Spowage, Head of National Accounts, and Simon Fuller, Deputy Director of the Office of the Chief Economic Advisor. Members have received a briefing paper from our witnesses, so we'll go straight to questions from the committee. And uh, the normal procedure is I'll open with some questions and I'll open out the session to colleagues uh, around the table. So first things first, um, basically in terms of your written submission, your very first sentence in the very first paragraph says, and I quote, economic statistics are an essential source of information for policymakers and government, parliament and the media, and academics and researchers, and I'm sure everyone here will agree with that. However, uh, numerous witnesses to this committee in, in recent weeks and indeed over years have expressed concerns that we do not have um, enough high quality uh, data. Um, so how would you actually remedy that? Okay, um, well, thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk about the economic statistics we produce. Um, there are challenges in producing comprehensive economic statistics for Scotland. Um, I would say that um, the National Accounts, which is what um, my area of responsibility, covers um, indicators which describe the Scottish economy, so things like gross domestic product and um, the flows of... Um, goods and services around our economy, those sorts of indicators. Um, um, historically, uh, there wasn't very many indicators produced about the Scottish economy. There, there has been, sort of, for many years, index of services and production, but it was only post-evolution, really, that we started to bring that together into a sort of formal GDP measure. Um, oh, so seven years ago now, the Scottish National Accounts Project was established to try and fill in some of the gaps in terms of the national accounts data that's available for Scotland. Um, and that's come a long way, although there are still obviously areas for um, further work. Um, we now publish a, a new bulletin which is really trying to um, bring together all the different data sources to tell us a lot more about the Scottish economy. And we have a lot more indicators such as savings ratios, estimates of imports, exports, capital investment in Scotland. Um, and we also publish detailed information about specific sectors of the economy like manufactured exports and retail sales. Um, there's also elsewhere in the Scottish Government, there's a lot of information on the labour market that's published as well as statistics on income and poverty, and also on business. So, in terms of comparing it to sort of other parts of the UK, we are pretty well served in Scotland in terms of economic statistics. But the, the aim of the Scottish National Accounts Project was to produce a range of indicators um, so we would have a full set of national accounts for Scotland. And by no means are we there. <laughs> um, there are certainly a lot of gaps but in a lot of cases, it isn't straightforward to do this for Scotland. So we're not able to collect the financial information we need for, from firms um, because their accounts don't break down their UK operations. Um, so it could be, it's very difficult for, for large firms anyway to provide a Scottish figure for their operations. And it's a particular problem for things like trade because they don't record that in that way. Um, so, for example, exports from Scotland to the rest of the UK is particularly challenging to measure, and even more challenging as imports from the rest of the UK to Scotland. So we are continually looking to improve the coverage of economic statistics. And I think it's important to stress that we don't do this, we don't set these priorities by ourselves. We have a lot of engagement with external users. Um, and so I welcome this engagement to get your thoughts on the things that we should be prioritising. But we have, we're quite lucky to have quite an active external user group, which is made up of academics um, and indeed some of the, the witnesses that you've had to the committee to talk about this. Um, so we recently had a meeting where we said we were, this year we were going to prioritise looking at improving data on imports for Scotland, um, data on capital investment uh, in Scotland, looking at the linkages between the offshore and onshore economy and also um, looking at the timeliness of our key outputs to see if we could improve that. 
um, for users. So those are the things we're focusing on. But it's a long um, journey, and we will also we will always have these challenges of the data just not being um, as good as it would be for something like the UK because businesses just don't structure their accounts in that way. So that's the challenge that we face. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Um, but there are some areas, surely, where there can be improvements. I mean, Spice, for example, have said a number of important pieces of economic data are either incomplete or missing. Uh, and you did actually touch on, on some of those gaps, and they, they talk about how the missing data limits our understanding of how Scotland's economy works. I mean, you've obviously touched on the Scottish National Accounts Project, but there are other areas, for example, which you didn't touch on in your response here, such as tourism. Um, and Spice have said this is based on a relatively small sample of data from the International Passenger Survey to estimate tourism expenditure in Scotland, and assumptions are made on the value of tourism from the rest of the UK. I mean, surely in areas like that, the, the, it must be more. Uh, you must be able to improve the, the, the data collection, given the fact that tourism, you know, is the biggest employer in the in, in, in the private sector in Scotland. I think I'd just like to draw a distinction between estimating the expenditure by tourists in Scotland mm -hmm. and estimating the activity of tourism related industries in Scotland. Mm -hmm. So we have very good information about, um, for example, accommodation and food services industries and other industries that are key for, for tourism in Scotland. So the activities of tourism related industries in Scotland is well understood. Now, quite often we get the question about the, the, the tourist industry um, that's sort of not the way it's defined in the national accounts. You know, there are various industries for which um, tourism is very important, and something like accommodation and food services is obviously one of those. So hotels, restaurants, and so on. Um, so, um, for example, our business statistics colleagues produce something or on key sectors, growth sectors in the Scottish economy, and so they try to take tourism-related industries together to produce an estimate for tourism. On, on these sorts of bases. So we do have a lot of information about the activity of tourism-related industry. Mm -hmm. This particular indicator that's referred to in the paper by Spice is our estimate of tourist expenditure in Scotland by tourists, which um, forms part of our exports estimate. So we do, we do have very good understanding of the activity um, in tourism-related industries. It's just the estimate of tourism expenditure, which is only... Um, fair quality we've said because the the sample that's used by the office for national statistics to estimate that is is, is fairly small so okay well, so. well let's go into the government expenditure and revenue at scotland uh, publication which of course comes out to great excitement every march i'm just uh, wondering how that how the accuracy of that can be improved for example in, in areas like defense understand that there's a uk assignation so for example three billion pounds is is assigned to uh, scotland as having is the amount spent in defense in scotland but of course it's more like two billion pounds so that makes it look as if there's a billion pounds more spent here than than is actually the case. I mean, surely there must be ways, given it's under Scottish uh, government control, to improve the the accuracy of the information that we actually have in GERS. Okay, so um, we do get asked this question a lot. I would say um, the GERS is about showing the expenditure um, for the benefit of the people of Scotland. Um, so after a lot of consultation with users, particularly in the major review of the document in 2007-8, um, <coughs> this is the definition that's used to assign spending to Scotland in GERS. So something like defence spending at the UK level, which um, in the Treasury's um, analysis of spending is classed as non-identifiable. So basically it can't be assigned to any part of the UK. <coughs> um, and um, because a lot of the spending can be overseas and so on, um, and it's seen for the benefit of the whole of the UK. So the GERS approach is to take a population share of that spending. So that's the approach that's used for something like defence spending, as well as it is done for things like public sector debt interest and so on. Yeah, so, so the GERS is really a combination of a lot of different kind of measures, basically, then. So there's not really a consistent format, is it, for a formula used... Because well, you, you're actually mixing apples and oranges there for you, not know? you know actual economic output and expenditure with you know assigned expenditure, if you like. Well, GERS is theoretical expenditure, even in terms of defence, obviously, you know. Well, given that <coughs> um, you know, so um, activity um, by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, for example, also is a lot of it can be overseas, 
and therefore that's seen as the, for the benefit of the whole of the UK, e sort of equally, and therefore that's how it's designed in GERS. Um, and, and defence spending is in that category as well. But um, So obviously there are other um, areas where we take... The, the, the approach to, to taken in GERS is about for the benefit of the people of Scotland. So, um, for example, some spending on um, museums, etc., in Scotland can be seen as not just for the benefit of the people in Scotland, but because we get a number of visitors from the rest of the UK, that can be seen for the benefit of, of uh, the wider UK. So we adjust the spending similarly. So it, it goes kind of both ways, but the, it's the four principle which we explain in our, um, in our publication. Um, but we're always happy to take feedback on whether we could improve our methodology and if... Um, you know, so it's ha it's helpful to get to get the the feedback that you feel that it's an inconsistent approach because we do try to take that oh. that for. Well, approach. I do think it is because I mean, obviously, when you know when it just comes out, you're arguing about you know the extent of the Scottish deficit are, are, are not thereof, and in actual fact, the deficit is really assumed as opposed to being real because you know would would any government spend the amount of money that's allocated effectively to that? I mean, it's it, to me, it just seems as if you're you, you, you know that it's not. It's not substantive in terms of the, the detail, you know. I mean, and I do think, you know, if you're going to have a, a document like that, surely it, it should be more robust in terms of the actual figures that are in it, rather than just extrapolations which aren't real, you know. I mean, you're more or less saying, you know, that if in, in defence, if you know, you could argue then if zero was spent in defence in Scotland, then because it's, you know, it, it gets a benefit, arguably, from the from um, the amount the UK spends on it. Certain aspects of that would be arguable, I would think. Uh, then you know whether it's a billion a actual spent in Scotland or two billion or three billion doesn't make any odds, you know, because it's it's seen as a percentage of the UK. I mean, I, I, so therefore the, the expenditure, the GERS expenditure, can't be seen to be accurate. I know you're kind of narrowing your eyebrows there to wonder what I'm really talking about, but all I'm trying to say is, if you, by but by your explanation, if one billion is spent in Scotland in defence or two billion or three billion, it does this impact impact on the GERS figures because it's seen to be what is Scotland's share of that is that the case or not? Uh, in a GERS sense, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. Okay. Fair enough. Right. Let's move on to something else. Uh, I mean, I mean, as further powers that are devolved, um, you know, it, is it appropriate that economic data like GERS and GDP is continue to be produced by the Scottish government, or should this not be produced independently of government by a body such as the ONS, uh, which publishes equivalent data at UK level? Um. Okay. Well. Uh, obviously, in the the statistics such as GERS and our GDP figures are produced by statisticians in the Scottish Government, um, and they are regularly assessed by the UK Statistics Authority. Um, GERS in particular um, is assessed um, fairly regularly, and the most recent assessment was done was finished in, in just before a publication in 2014. Um, so. The assessment really from the UK Statistics Authority is to check that we're producing the documents according to sound methods that we're consulting users on uh, meeting their needs um, and that they're reliable statistics and that they are managed um, objectively and impartially in the public interest. So the National Statistics Badge really is there to reassure users that these are of a certain quality and that they've been managed impartially and objectively. So, as statistician of the government, we work under the Code of Practice for Official Statistics, and that sets very strict guidelines about um, how we produce um, our statistics and how we share them with, um, how and when we share them with um, colleagues and ministers. So, we work under that um, Code of Practice at the moment. So. Okay. Um, just a couple of brief further points, and I'll open up the session to colleagues uh, around the table. Um, just one, uh, which is um, about uh, price pricing. Um, the Fiscal Affairs Scotland, in its recent review of GDP, suggested a Scottish Consumer Price Index um, would be worth um, collecting in, in terms of improving <coughs> the data. How do you feel about that? Well, the Fiscal Affairs Scotland analysis was looking at the sort of overall level of price movements. Um, implied by um, our, our real terms, GDP gross, and our current price, sort of cash value of GDP. So, um, 
I think that there are differences in how those things move relative to each other um, um, for Scotland and the UK, and that's called the implied deflator. And what that really is is overall movements in, in aggregate prices um, for the Scottish and UK economies. Now, those are different for our sets of measures, and that's what Fiscal Fair Scotland um, was analysing. And the very fact they are different shows that these are capturing the different movements in prices. Because basically, we build up at a very detailed series level, um, either using an appropriate, what's called a volume measure. Um, so for things like electricity and gas supply, we would be using the production of electricity in, in, in gigawatt hours. Um, or we use a deflated turnover measure using the most appropriate deflator, which can be a UK deflator, but it's a very detailed series level. And when you build that all up for Scotland, the aggregate movement of prices is different for the UK and Scotland because of the different industrial mix. So the very fact that these movements are different is captured in the way that we build our statistics. And we're following sort of international guidance here, which means if you do it at a detailed enough series level, UK um, prices can be appropriate to use for Scotland. So basically different price movements that are shown by our series are reflective of the different industrial structure. So the question really is, are these detailed price indices that we're using for each series the most appropriate one? Um, and sort of case by case, we look, at, look for the most appropriate price index to use. <clears throat> so, for example, um, a subset of education is things like driving schools, that sort of thing. Um, we would never use a UK education deflator to turn that from um, current to constant prices because that's completely dominated by English tuition fee prices. So that wouldn't be an appropriate one to use. So we use a deflator which is more appropriate for the expenditure on personal spending on these sorts of things like driving schools. So we, we look for the most appropriate one. Do we have a set of Scottish price indices to choose from? No, we don't, because we don't collect the information that would be required to produce those. Um, and that would in, incur a huge cost to do so. Um, but given that we're doing it at such a detailed over 100 series level, and the guidance from Eurostat is around at least sort of 30 or 40 industries, you know, we're confident that it's capturing correctly the pr different price movements in the Scottish and UK economies. Okay. So. Thank you. Thank you for that detailed uh, answer. Just a final point I was going to make and make was about regarding the proposal to assign half of VAT uh, raised in Scotland. It's uh, unclear how this will be calculated. I wonder if you can give us some uh, uh, views of your thinking on that. Yeah, brilliant. Um, I would say that um, it's a challenge, as it can be for a lot of things, to measure this um, for Scotland. The approach taken for GERS is reasonably um, broad brush, I would say. Um, although it can be seen as fit for purpose for a statistical publication such as GERS, but when you're talking about it being used to actually assign budgets, it's, it's a different, you know, it's a completely different matter. So at the moment, um, the VAT estimate um, is built up of a few different sections, but the majority of it is based on VAT paid by the final consumer, so by people going into shops and buying things, basically. Um, and it uses a measure of household consumption. So there's a survey which surveys households in a very detailed manner about the things that they buy, um, and that is then used to estimate um, the share of VAT that should be assigned to Scotland for the household sector. Um, now, this is a, at the moment, this is based on a survey of 500 households a year for Scotland, so that's a very small, in statistical terms, uh, survey. So... Um, the sample is pooled over three years to get more stable results. So there are a number of issues with that. Um, the responsiveness of the survey to change will be um, reduced. The sampling variability is, is likely to be quite large. And that obviously is not a desirable um, thing for uh, if this is actually being used to determine the budget. 
So um, this is definitely an issue um, which needs to be looked at. Um, so we're start we are starting a programme of work with our colleagues in HMRC to look at improving the measurement of VAT. And um, they're, they're just starting a, a sort of audit of all of the different data sources that can go into measuring this uh, better and, and doing a better job of measuring it and whether there needs to be an increase in the sample of this particular survey or if there are other ways to measure it um, more precisely. So. I'm tempted to ask further questions on that, but I want to open up the session to colleagues around the table who may do so themselves. Uh, first uh, person to ask questions will be Gavin, to be followed by John. Good morning. Um, you mentioned in, in one of your early answers that the, the initial objective of SNAP was to get a, a full set of national accounts, um, and you said we're, we're not there yet. Now, obviously, it has evolved slightly since, since 2008, but in, in terms of the initial objectives, is, is there any sort of sense of when we will be there, uh, in inverted commas? Um, I, yeah, well, it depends what you class as sort of end of this um, this project. I mean, what, what we if you're asking kind of the things that we don't have, um, at the moment there are there are measures in our accounts which aren't um, of the you know gold standard quality and it's sort of things like imports or, or something like that. But the beauty of the framework is a framework allows you to estimate those things which you don't have primary data for because of the way you balance it all. You know. So that's kind of the beauty of the framework and using um, the supply and demand in the economy to balance everything. But what we don't have is we don't have um, sectoral accounts. You know. But then that would be a, a, a very big development programme to get sectoral accounts for all the different types of corporations in Scotland and the government sector and the rest of the world. And particularly challenging is... The, the balance of payments with the rest of the world, um, measuring flows of income in and out of the out of Scotland and transfers in and out of Scotland. And to be honest, while um, we can develop estimates of these things, um, they will only ever be modelled, estimated, um, because of um, we don't have that data about what's flowing across the border, and we don't have the information about what's raised in Scotland. So, um, I can I could give the committee maybe more detail on this and follow up in terms of the things, all of the items that we are missing, I suppose, from the set. Because if you're asking me, are we sort of halfway there, or <laughs> you know, I, I wouldn't say we are. Okay. You know, that is, it's not. We've not got most of the things that are in a full set of national accounts, um, and part of that's about data, and part of that's about the number of people that we have working on it. So. Okay, thank you. Um, Obviously, SNAP was, was set up in 2008. Since then, you've had um, the Calvin Commission in taxes devolved through that. Uh, we're, getting, or we're getting the Smith Commission in taxes devolved through that. So what, what changes need to be... How does SNAP need to evolve and what changes are going to be prioritised to take into account um, taxes that have been and will be devolved? OK. Um, well, I think looking at the estimation of... Um, various taxes, like, for example, the VAT issue, um, becomes more important if, if they're likely to be devolved, looking at how these have been estimated in the past and um, whether there needs to be improvements. Obviously, taxes that are being devolved to be collected in Scotland are somewhat easier because, you know, there's no estimation needed that, you know, it will be raised in Scotland and therefore um, becomes easier. But I think we need to then look at what we're publishing about those statistics. So the sorts of uh, the way we're publishing the revenues collected in Scotland and, you know, um, are our users getting enough information about what's been collected in the context of all of the other taxes that are raised in Scotland, which we are estimating. So perhaps, you know, about the way we publish revenue information um, and making it more accessible for users, that sort of thing. Um, other things that, that we're, we're trying... There is a lot of interest in sort of the, the trade... Um, aspect and how much we can improve that um, and there's also a lot of interest in the links between the onshore and offshore economy so those are the things that we're prioritizing this year but I don't know if Simon wants to add anything to that. Yeah, I'd just like to add a couple of things to that which is obviously the Scotland Act and subsequently Smith Commission has very much guided what we prioritize within our team in terms of what we look at so for example 
when we're looking at what taxes can we improve the estimates of, what we put a lot of work over the last few years into improving our estimates of air passenger duty, because clearly that's one which is coming to Scotland and there's great interest in. Likewise with income tax, which is coming in a staged manner via the Scotland Act and Smith Commission, we already have a good estimate of the overall level of income tax in Scotland, so what we've been putting a lot of our resources into is understanding the detail behind that. So for example, if we know total income tax is 11 billion, What's the distribution of that across the income distribution? How much is paid by basic, higher, and top rate of tax payers? So all of our focus has been on basically getting the much more data and working with HMRC to improve our wider analytical capacity to inform the broader analysis which is required when these new taxes as they are devolved. Okay, thank you. Um, just a quick question about GERS. I mean, it, it obviously comes out every March, and that there are revisions to the to the previous year's GERS. My, my feeling on this year's GERS was that the revisions just seemed to be more significant and more marked in previous years. I mean, is, is, is that correct? And is there a reason for that in particular, or is that something that could carry on going forward? It is correct that the revisions were, were larger than one would normally expect, yes. And uh, the main reason for that is the transition to the European System of Accounts 2010. So there's a number of changes in treatment. Um, Unfortunately, that um, impacted the latest year, well, the 12-13, sort of the, the last published year in particular, quite um, significantly because there was inclusion of things like the, the purchase of the Royal Mail Pension Scheme, which was a large sort of one-off um, only in that year. But um, it did change the figures you know, quite a lot in that year. Um, so there were a number of different changes um, which we sort of detail in the document. Um, but... No, I wouldn't expect this level of revision, you know, every year. It's only because of a major change to the system of accounts, which, you know, obviously we have to incorporate so so that our statistics are still comparable with the UK. So, no, I wouldn't expect that yeah, sort so of level. So the changes basically feed through in one year and you, it shouldn't have an impact on, on future ones. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. i just add to that, but, um, obviously these are similar changes occurred at the UK level sure. and across other countries, so the revisions in Scotland were not uncomparable. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, if I'm going to just a, a couple of specific specific taxes, and you talk a little bit about your your modelling for LBTT in the the paper you presented to us, um, can you tell us just a little bit more about that model? And then, are there any changes planned to that model based on the, the comments of the fiscal commission? Yep. So the model of land and buildings transaction tax is built up from basically a detailed information on virtually every single housing transaction in Scotland over recent years. So with LBTT, we're very lucky that we know the detail of transactions on a per transaction basis. We know selling prices, dates of sale, locations within Scotland and so on. So what the model does is it takes this historic data of levels of transactions in Scotland, distributions of transactions and so on and then seeks to project that forward based on trends over recent years, how we expect that to evolve in the future. So, for example, if transactions have just now been well below their long-term average, it may all be reasonable to expect you know, a gradual uptick to return to long-run levels. So we take that information, and then what we combine it with is wider intelligence and modelling of what's happening in the Scottish economy. So, for example, all else being equal, if you expect the Scottish economy to grow strongly over the coming years, based on what our wider economic models would suggest, we would look at the relationship historically between GDP growth and housing transactions and prices, incorporate that into our model to then model how we expect transactions to evolve in the future, how we expect prices as well to evolve in the future. And from that, we would then derive from the expected bans, the expected rates, what we could expect the, um, the aggregate level of tax receipts to be. I'd, just, I'd add two points onto that. Firstly, particularly with what you're saying with regards to the Scottish Fiscal Commission, so last year was obviously the first year in which we produced these forecasts, and obviously so we had a number of discussions with the Fiscal Commission about this, we had a number of very valuable feedback from them. And so the model we are using, I mean, essentially it all goes continuous improvement, continuous evolution, part of it's incorporate their changes, but also just because as the economy changes, we need to focus on different parts of the economy, make sure we're actively picking them up and so on. And so the final point I would say, just is more just to flag up more than anything else, that of all the taxes, land, land buildings, transaction tax, SDLT as it was in the UK before, is one of the more volatile taxes, and so it always presents challenges. You saw it halved in the UK level during the recession, but despite that, we have a very detailed modelling framework and a lot of raw data underpinning it. 
Okay. So you're, ma you're making improvements, and obviously it was year one, and, and the idea is to keep improving. I suppose one, one specific point the Fiscal Commission made was around behavioural costing, and, and their view was, or their point was that there was no behavioural costing at all. And I think that I mean, certainly the Cabinet Secretary seemed to suggest that that, that was a true criticism or a true comment. Um, obviously, you've got static costing, which just looks at the numbers alone, and then the behavioural costing says, well, what's the likely impact, and how likely are those numbers? Are you going? To, are you planning to incorporate some behavioural element into the model for the next set of projections? It's definitely something we're looking at. Yes, it's um, again the behavioural part in some ways much more challenging, partly because obviously LBTT it represented quite a significant divergence from the previous system, moving away from a slab tax to much more progressive tax. So, in some ways, as we go forward with the tax, as we get more data, as we get a much better understanding of how consumers and households have evolved and have responded to these changes, we'll have a much better, we'll be much better position to actually incorporate those behavioural changes. But again, it, it almost takes time to build up this data to, to be able to say with sufficient confidence this is what we can expect behavioural change to be based on past experience. Okay. And just last question, I mean, again, you say in your paper that the, the GDP uh, figures, that's your most high profile uh, quarterly output. Um, do you, does your department make? I mean, obviously you don't you don't publish formal projections, but do do you internally have um, a model where you try to have projections to see if your um, your internal model is anything like what does happen, or do you, do you simply not touch it? Um, there's two points I'd make about that. So I think I believe in the paper we provided to you, we discussed in a little bit some of the modelling we're currently developing, and that talks about the fact that we are in the process of developing a macroeconomic forecasting model for Scotland. It's, the model is complete, but we're still sort of in the testing phase, so it, it, can't, it can't provide usable outputs as yet. But I guess the second point to make is that when looking especially at a quarter ahead, these types of forecasts, you wouldn't normally use a very big detailed macroeconomic model to do that. What you probably use is a very data-driven model. So you'd say, for example, OK, these are all the data sets we know for the next quarter already, whether it's from um, the labour market, from business surveys and so on. In the past, we know that these are broadly correlated with GDP growth in such a way. And so we can infer from that what you may expect GDP to go in broad terms. And that then helps inform what we're seeing in terms of the actual statistics and actual GDP numbers we have. So we very much use to help guide our process and to help support our wider intuition. So, I mean, and just finally then, if I, if I may, I mean, th th there's work being done on that, and obviously it's experimental just now, so you're not in a position to publish. But is, is the intention then of the Scottish Government to publish GDP forecasts? I don't think I'd like to prejudge it at this stage, because that very much depends on the current pro programme of work and essentially how the model looks like it's performing, basically. This is the first time we've had such a model for Scotland. Mm -hmm. And so it's impossible to say at this stage quite how it will be able to be used in the future and how usable it will be for that specific purpose. Sure. OK, no, thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, John, to be followed by Jean. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, I mean, a, a few issues that have been mentioned already, maybe we can look at a little bit more. Um, the, the comment's been made that, uh, you know, we've got a lot less statistics and figures than other countries do, or the UK as a whole does, but we, we do quite well compared to other regions or sub-states or whatever we want to call them. Um, I mean, are there good examples out there or are there others that are doing better of the sub-states? You know, California, Bavaria, Catalonia, anything like that? Um, and not that I'm aware of. I mean, um, we have done some work on this and um, it, is, it is quite um, tricky to find um, areas who are doing um, sub-state um, um, supply use tables, for example, which is a sort of framework with which we build on all of our estimates. Um, there are a number of other countries who estimate things like um, growth, economic growth and things like that at a lower level. Um, so um, not that I'm aware of, mm -hmm. to be honest. Um, and I mean, amongst countries then, uh, does it vary a lot? I mean, does a big country like the United States have fabulous data and a little one like Luxembourg have much poorer or does it not work that way? Well, uh, for example, across the EU, all countries have the requirement have requirements to produce the same sorts of things and give them to Eurostat. Um, exactly how they do it, 
and how much resource you put into it and what sort of quality they are does vary. Um, so yeah, larger countries are likely to have a much bigger all singing, all dancing um, if set of national accounts which are of higher quality. For example, the UK um, produces what it needs to do for Eurostat, but it also does a lot of other things. So for example, it needs to produce its GDP figures um, within 60 days, but it also produces a figure which is one of the fastest in the world, um, sort of 25 days after the end of the quarter. Um, so it doesn't need to do that for Eurostat, and, and most other European countries don't do that. Um, but the UK does, um, because it's, it's that much bigger, and the number uh, of people working on the national accounts is, is, is much and, and is accuracy sacrificed because of that speed? Yeah, basically. The, the, the amount of data that they've got in for the quarter is quite, is quite limited. So I think, it's about, I think the figure is about they've got about 40% of the data that they will eventually use. To, um, to finalise the estimate. So with with all of, with these economic statistics, with these quarterly ones in particular, you've got to balance up the accuracy and the timeliness um, with each other, and to decide how much le what level of revision you're ex you're prepared to accept, because they will be revised going forward. Other countries, we we have done some work with um, with the Irish national accounts people, for example. Um, because I kind of wanted to get a bit of a perspective from a smaller country with a, with a more sort of closer to our size of um, national accounts uh, unit. So they've got sort of maybe 40 people compared to our 10, but it's still, it's still, it's still a little bit more comparable. And um, they produce one GDP estimate a quarter compared to the UK's three. And they produce it 70 days after the end of the quarter because they've negotiated that with Eurostat because that's the sort of best they can do. Um, so that's sort of a more um, realistic place um, for um, for us to sort of look at aiming for. Um, I'm not saying that that's what we'll do, but at least it gives us sort of hope that we could, you know, that doesn't seem quite so impossible. Yeah. So there's kind of a range of experience out, out there. Yeah, yes. and, and it's very helpful to talk to other countries in Europe. I mean, we have a lot of engagement with C1S, and they're very um, helpful, and they give us a lot of data because basically most of our data comes from them that we're using to, mm -hmm. to produce our national accounts. Mm -hmm. But it is good to see these other, perspective, uh, these other perspectives and, and the other ways yes. of doing things. So, I mean, if you, obviously, if you had 40 staff instead of 10, you could do more. Yeah. But, but there's, the other side that's been mentioned is that some things are legally required by the yes. state. Now, who, who decides that? I mean, is that, is, is that totally a reserve matter at UK level that the UK government can say what organisations have to break down their figures to, for example, VAT, or...? You no, know, it's all driven by Eurostat, so the EU, basically. So all member states in the EU. Um, so they need to produce regional accounts, for example, because the, the EU asks for it. But the regional accounts are, um, are very... Um, they're modelled estimates of UK figures, basically, mm -hmm. down to the different areas of the UK... And it goes down to quite a detailed level, sort of equivalent to local authority level. But they're very um, different to the statistics that we produce for Scotland mm -hmm. because we build them kind of from the bottom up. Yes. So um, so they do have a requirement to produce regional information. And, for example, the, the information that's used at the what's called the Nuts 2 level, so sub-Scotland, sort of, there's four areas in Scotland. That's what's used to determine European structural funding, for example. Mm -hmm. So that's how the EU use that information. So... Um, Estimates I've heard from the Central Statistics Office in Ireland, for example, are that 90% of what they do is because they must do it. They're required to do it by EU law. Mm -hmm. And I've heard estimates from ONS that it's sort of 80 to 90%. So mm -hmm. the work of these national stats institutes in the EU is the vast majority is driven by what Eurostat insists they must okay. do. So who's telling... I mean, if... Obviously, there's been a lot of discussion about company profits and how they get moved around countries. So, um, you know, I think it would be doubtful even if some of these companies, you know, what their profits are in the UK or their sales or their VAT, let alone yeah. within Scotland or whatever. I mean, is the, is the European Union then instructing them? I mean, say, take a company like, say, Diageo that's international. Who's telling them how they have to split up their accounts? I think, I think this is almost a slightly, slightly it's a wider discussion almost in the sense that there's, I think there's a distinction to be made between the economic statistics, how these statistics are produced and how they're disseminated and so on, whilst 
I think the issue in terms of tax payments and where the tax liability of a company's operations falls is a slightly separate issue. And that's normally an issue which would be agreed between finance ministries. It would be agreed perhaps between OECD members about common methodologies, common accounting practices for how profits should be assigned. And obviously at the European level as well. But it wouldn't be so much with regards to the statistical collection and data collection that the agreement would be take place. It would be very much an accounting and a finance ministry or almost a revenue collection issue rather than a pure statistical issue in the sense of for producing economic statistics. Yes. But but you're relying on some of these accounting figures, are you, for uh, yeah, well, GDP lot, and things? A lot of um, their statistics are based on the business surveys that are carried out by the ONS. Mm-hmm. Now, um, a number of companies will um, put in, in these surveys this, a similar information as is in their company accounts. Um, so it does present a challenge in, in things like um, estimating income flows, for example. So if you're going to estimate your your gross national income, that becomes very relevant because then you're you're talking about where income's flowing after it's the stuff's produced and profits are made. Where does that then flow to? Mm-hmm. Um, and that can be more um, challenging to measure. Um, you know, for example, Ireland have a, a lot of issues with that. Um, so even though they're the a sovereign companies. state, they find that difficult. It's challenging, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And some of that will be a legal requirement on companies or other organisations to produce the data, I take it? Is that, is, that all, is that all reserved to UK then, that they could tell companies to produce yes. data if yes. they wanted? So they, they produce it, um, they, they collect everything under the Stats of Trade Act, so it's, um, it's a legal obligation for companies to, to fill in the surveys. So. Okay. I mean, some of the in the spice paper. I mean, it concerned me a little bit about some of the things we were being told about. You know, like the imports figures, which I think you've mentioned already, mm-hmm. seem to be you know incredibly vague. The remaining it talks about various figures and then says the remaining difference is assumed to, to be imports, mm-hmm. <laughs> which struck me as pretty vague. I mean, again, a kind of UK or any state level. Are they very clear about what their imports are, or are they vague as well? Yeah, they, especially, well, goods in particular, stuff that's moving across the border, um, there's very good data on from HMRC. Um, and we can exploit some of that data. Um, we don't get access to, to um, a lot of the, the data from HMRC, but there is a lot we can use in terms of international imports, and that's what we're looking at at the moment, exploiting that. Um However, more challenging is imports from um, from the rest of the UK for us, so because there's no sort of official border there. That um, services is more tricky, even for countries like the UK. So they do surveys like the International Trade and Services to try and get a sense of um, services flowing across the border, because obviously it's less tangible than than a good <laughs> actually leaving or or uh, entering the country. But yeah, so. So even so, the state, UK and other countries are struggling with that then? Yeah, there's a cer- you, with services, certainly. And obviously yeah. that's the vast majority of the economy. So it, it, is, it is challenging. And also um, the definitions of imports and exports in the national accounts have changed since the introduction of the new system of accounts. So there's, there's supposed to be, for goods, there's supposed to be a change in ownership. It's not just about it flowing across the border. And that, that just complicates everything so much more because um, it just makes the the challenge of measuring these things. And that's something that hasn't really been implemented across Europe yet because the countries can't figure out how to sort of, mm-hmm. how to do it. So, so that's a, a, that'd be a problem if a company, I don't know, Volkswagen or something, is just moving stuff between branches? Precisely. So if they're sending um, I don't know, a car to Scotland to be sprayed and then sent back again or something like that, you know, there's no change in ownership of that. So officially under national accounts, the new national accounts, that's not a... Um, an import than an export. That's just a, an export of a service right. to the country. So it just complicates everything massively. Okay. Uh, I mean, another one that seemed a little bit vague in the Spice paper was a uh, capital investment. Yes. Um, and it says there's reasonable... Public sector's pretty reasonable, but private sector is a bit more difficult. And yes. there seems to be an assumption that profits basically equals capital investment. Yeah, there's, there's, this is not our, our strongest um, set of d- data. There's definitely issues with it, um, and it's our, one of our priorities for this year to look at it. It's very, it's difficult to. Capital investment can be very lumpy, and there's no requirement on companies to tell the ONS where it is they're investing this money 
um, in the UK. Now, there's been a lot of pressure from from us um, and from regional accounting people in ONS to try and collect more information for la really large bits of capital investment. Where you know where is it? You know, are you building a building? Where where is that building? You know, where what is the location of this capital investment? And if that's approved, then obviously that would improve our um, estimates by quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but we're also looking at the data that ONS do collect from Scottish companies to see if we can exploit that more than we have been. Um, with this, there's, there's so many things you could do that you have to prioritise. Yeah. Um, but capital investment is, is one of the things that we need to look at this year because we, I think we can improve it, even with the data that we have. Um, but if this um, more detailed data was collected from companies about these big bits of it, because it's really it's the, the big stuff, if you get that right, mm -hmm. then you're doing pretty well. OK, and the final point I think I wanted to touch on was just, again, VAT. I mean, we've, we've been having discussions as to if we do get a share of VAT, is it just what the a customer pays in the shop at the end or is it also what the, every factory increases value um, even though um, the, the end sale might be elsewhere because VAT is based on each step of the pro process. I mean, from your point of view, is it more difficult to get the data from the latter scenario because it's coming from different places? Is yeah. it would be easier to get the data for the or statistics for the the more simple that it's just in the shops and, and so on? Yeah, the end consumer, basing the consumer it on is. consumption yes. is, um, is, is definitely the, the simplest the way to approach the, the VAT paid by the household sector. Yeah. There are also, you know, the exempt sector and government. Government's obviously simpler, um, but the exempt sector can be quite challenging as well yeah. to estimate properly, such as um, financial services and, um, and charities, for example. So okay. there are a lot of challenges, but um, we will be working very closely with HMRC on this. Thanks so much. Things. That's very helpful. Thank you. Mark, you want to do a brief supplementary? Yeah, just a, a, a brief supplementary convener before every question that I had written down gets taken away. <laughs> <laughs> just on the capital investment issue, um, you spoke about the difficulty in terms of determining what's being developed and where. Um, presumably, obviously, there are there are ways that that can be collected. For example, local authorities will, for example, be issuing building warrants for for premises that are being uh, developed. They'll also be issuing um, business rates bills for for newly developed properties. Are these areas that you're looking to collect? Because obviously, rateable value will give you some indication as to the, to the value uh, of of a development. Is that something you're looking into in terms of collecting that data? Uh, yes, certainly. We'll, we'll, we're sort of doing. Um, we're starting out on a sort of audit of all of the different data sources we could use to improve our estimates. So yes, we'll, we'll be looking into that. Okay. Thank you. Gene, to follow by Richard. Thank you very much, uh, convener. I, I think over the, the last couple of years of being here, we've, we've become aware. I'm certainly aware of of the, the lack of information at the Treasury, I guess, and HMRC of of because they've never really needed to do it. To, to show the difference uh, or figures specifically for Scotland. Do you think that they are working towards that more and more? Is that getting easier? And are you part of that? Um, well, since um, we've been working quite closely across um, devolved administrations and with the, the Treasury, with HMRC and with ONS um, and the Cabinet Office, um, in a statistical environment and thinking about the data that may be required um, as a result of the devolution of further powers to all areas of the UK. And I think the, the focus is for um, looking at solutions that can be sort of future proof, so they're not just maybe for one area of the UK, but if you're looking at improving information, you know, let's think about how it could be used across the UK and um, you know, thinking about things for the English regions as well. Um, so yes, there was a there was a big discussion we had about that, and we're, there was a group sort of formed to discuss, you know, based on the, the current um, proposals, um, what might be the sort of work programmes that might need to go ahead. So this this, this seems very high um, um, up the list in terms of what the the Treasury and HMRC and um, ONS are thinking about in terms of data, um, and particularly the ONS are. Um, prioritising, seem to be prioritising developing statistics for different areas of the country. You know, which, you know, from my point of view, um, I would like them to collect lots more data, <laughs> which gives us more um, 
finely grained estimates in terms of the activity in Scotland. Um, rather than, you know, I'm not so focused on the publishing statistics, but obviously other users would want them to, to publish statistics as well. So um, so I would say that, that that process has been very positive and it's raised a number of issues. So now we need to see kind of what happens next. So um, right. once, um, um, you know, the further powers are sort of more firm. And I mean, just going on from that, for example, you you, you talked about the the information that's required to go to Europe. Yeah. I mean, is that something that you would do as an exercise to show how, where gaps are and things like that? Yeah, that so would probably be the approach. We have to make that return for Scotland independently. What, don't we? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that would be the way I would approach it, yes. Um, and I could do that for the committee if that would be helpful. So. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about, it seems that in, in the Smith Commission we have... Uh, a number of areas um, of our economy where we, where we're responsible for part. So, you know, part income tax, the Scottish rate of income tax, the um, potential to have fifty percent of our VAT back, and and all the kind of complications that one imagines at the at, at the back of that as to actually what that really is. Would you, in your opinion, would you think that it might be easier? Would we would we get much greater information even if we were responsible to collect our own VAT? Now I know that the complication with Europe and so on that the VAT, VAT has to be collected, but however, on a regional basis, would it be would it be almost easier to collect just just on VAT alone to have these figures here and and then deliver them to the to the HMRC rather than try and do a fairly complicated I think, I think there's probably pros and cons of both approaches I would say I think if you go down the approach which you've um, just outlined one potential challenge is that in some cases it may well be easier to do things to collect the taxes or identify the taxes paid at the UK level, and in particular in this case, given that all of the companies will be operating UK-wide, in effect, in other particular cases, for some companies it may well be easier to do it on a Scottish subsample. To be honest, it's not something we've thought about um, you know, personally in any great detail, but I can see pros and cons with both approaches. I don't think it would be clear-cut in this particular instance, especially yeah. given that control of the tax will remain reserved. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you did say that one of the difficulties you had in establishing some of the stats about businesses and where their business was done, would that, would that not actually clarify that much more if there had to be a return for a business that was in Scotland? If they had to do that, then yes, it would improve the statistics. <laughs> um, but I suppose it would have downsides in terms of burden on business, having to separate that out, and also the administration costs of actually collecting as well. So I, I guess um, from a purely statistical point of view, yes, I would love every business to say all of, you know, what they do in Scotland. Um, that would be marvellous. But um, I guess is, is, is that um, enough, that benefit, um, enough to justify the cost to business and, and potential collection costs and things like that? So I guess it's a balance. Okay. And, and just um, finally, we, you, we talked a bit, the, the convener mentioned tourism and, and the importance of that and how that's calculated. But actually, I, I think I'm right in saying that the tourism figures certainly that are calculated to show how many people work in tourism in Scotland go across a whole range of businesses that may actually all sit in another sector. For example, they have a percentage of tourism, of a retail sector that they take into tourism. But it would be quite important to keep these kind of separate, in a sense, for the purpose that, of getting a picture across Scotland of what we look like. So tourism as a kind of umbrella. Yeah, which, I mean, which whereas, a number of different industries, which yeah. is why in, in sort of in national accounts terms, it's, it's not an industrial classification because um, it's about the types of goods and services that the industry is providing rather mm -hmm. than who is consuming them. Whereas um, analysis like the growth sector analysis that uh, my business colleagues produce can then look at all of the different um, sectors of the economy that tend to be dominated by tourist consumers 
and bring them together to produce estimates, as, as you describe. So they are kind of different products for different purposes. Okay. And finally, um, we, there, there, well, during the, the referendum campaign, there was a, a number of uh, claims made about the amount of business going both north and south of the border, but in fact, they probably were very vague from, from everything you've said, that these stats don't actually exist. Would that be right? The 60 mean, sorry? Well, one of the uh, issues uh, that Mari mentioned was the difficulty. It's, it's easier to know what our exports are to the rest of Europe or the rest of the world, but actually crossing the border from Scotland to England is, is much harder. And I'm just making yeah. the point that there, was, you know, that there were some facts and figures um, produced uh, to, during the referendum campaign, but I just wonder how easy that would have been to be exact about, for example, the amount our, our market in England. So well, that I think, would be I think taken it, as a percentage. In terms of exports, we're in a better position than we are for imports because we do do a survey of businesses um, called the Global Connection Survey to estimate um, uh, exports to the rest of the world and all of the country destinations, but also to the rest of the UK. So that's a key data source for us because that's kind of one that we do have, which shows um, the flows, at least the market for Scottish goods in the rest of the UK. Um, so... Um, so we're pretty we get we actually and even though it's not a statutory survey we don't collect it on the stats of trade act we one s to we do get a good response from businesses on it which is, is quite heartening and we also bring in a number of other data sources basically whatever we can to improve the estimates so um so for exports we're pretty we're all right for exports to be honest we get good data although we would always want more um it, it's more um, imports this is more challenging so that's why we use the, the framework of the national accounts to estimate that. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Um, that leads me on to, to, to my question, which wasn't an import data, because you said to, we've talked generally about the importance of having enough data uh, to, um, uh, to, 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 to inform your work. In response to Mr. Mason's questions on import data, you said you had a lot of information available from HMRC and import data, but there was also a lot of information that wasn't uh, available to you. And I just want to say, why is that data not available to you? Is it because it's not being collected by HMRC? Or is there a problem there accessing that information? And why should that be the case? Because presumably, at all levels of government, there must be uh, importance placed on uh, on ensuring you have all the data you need as part of this process. Yes. Um, uh, some of the data... <laughs> We have had difficulties, some difficulties in the past getting access to some data from HMRC for um, uh, for a number of reasons, and some of them are kind of legislative issues. Um, and um, ONS, for example, do get access to what's called the um, intrastat and extrastat data, which is the record that businesses have to give about um, their goods crossing the border mm -hmm. um, between intrastats for it in EU and extra stats for out with the EU. Um, and that's a key source of information for the UK's balance of payments. Um, we don't currently have access to that information and neither do the other devolved administrations. Um, What's, what reasons given for that, can I ask? Um, that I think I think sometimes they've I would have to check exactly what um, they said the last time we were, we were asked. Sounds like it may not be a terribly good reason for the uh, response, but I mean, it's it just, seems to it's me just it's more. A, I think the business case yeah. to get access to HMRC data has to be very strong, and obviously, um, the National Statistics Institute need to give balance of payments data to Eurostat, and therefore that is a very strong um, case for getting that information. And given the, the importance of being placed on developing a fiscal framework for Scotland, Kavina, I think this is something we need to return to, because it's absolutely essential that I, the Scottish I, government ha I has would, access to the appropriate level of data. I would absolutely agree. And relevant to this is um, there's a data sharing bill um, at the UK level, which was sort of uh, was started in um, under the last UK Parliament okay. and, and is still... Um, at early stages and it hasn't sort of gone through Parliament or anything yet. And that was with... The idea of that is to allow HMRC to share more data with um, with ONS and other departments. So I would hope that that would be a route th through which um, more data sharing could happen 
um, and the barriers mm. that the HMRC feel that they have in sharing data with um, with other UK government departments would be, would be removed. I think it's, a, it's surprising that it requires legislation. But obviously, it's something that we'll need to pursue with with, with both governments, and of course, particularly with the UK government on this issue. I've got one final question, Karina, if that's all right. Um, in your submission, you uh, mentioned for the development of oil and gas statistics publications. Can I just ask what progress you're making on that? What level of detail you seem to go into for the publications, and uh, with what regularity you think they'll be published? Um, okay, we publish. Um, an, uh, it's, it's not quite a bulletin yet, quarterly, because it's still in early um, development stages. Um, with information on um, production and indicative sales revenues um, for uh, for different types of products in the North Sea, um, and it's a sort of quarterly series which shows um, the production of all of these different uh, products and and therefore what um, sales revenue might be generated. We also produce um, indicative trade flows as well, which means that you can um, because our um, uh, principal uh, GDP measures and trade flows and so on are based on onshore Scotland. Um, you can then add in the offshore component, and that's what we do to show the overall trade balances. So that's the oil and gas statistics publication that we publish quarterly, and the plan for that would be really to take it to, to become a more um, established. Um, so it will be quarterly on a formal basis from the near yes, future. Yes, yes. Thank so. you very much. Um, well, I think most areas have been covered, and it's been very interesting uh, listening to what you've said. So it's really just three follow-up questions to what you've said. And the first one may have been partly covered by your last answer, but you said new priorities that you listed included capital investment, which you've covered, imports, which you've covered, and the relationship between the onshore and the offshore economy. So I was interested in that last one. Um, it's more than what you said in the last answer, I take it, is there? That's that's sort of yeah. a, um, a, a sort of additional piece yeah. of work, and that would be more um, looking at um, our supply use framework. So all of the different products and industries and the economy and all of the links between them, uh -huh. how those link to the the offshore economy, which would give us a better understanding of the kind of supply chain. Um, so to what the offshore um, economy is buying, um, and and therefore. Um, the impacts of changes in the offshore economy right, on the okay. onshore supply chain. Mm -hmm. So it, that would be a more detailed piece of work, and mm -hmm. we're, we're going to be looking at that in the development of our next set of supply use tables. And our users are quite interested in that um, in terms of the sort of the total, mm -hmm. the, the total um, contribution of the offshore mm -hmm. economy to the onshore economy. So. Um, the second point, and again, perhaps I'm missing something here, but you yeah. kept saying GERS was for the benefit of the people of Scotland, so I, I, I couldn't The expenditure quite, uh, in GERS, yeah. It's, it's uh, done on the... <laughs> yeah. So it's not what's spent in Scotland, uh, necessarily. It's, it's what's spent for the benefit of the people of Scotland. So if, if there's a UK uh, reserve matter and money's been spent abroad, um, then... For example, a population share of that may be taken because it's seen as for the benefit of all citizens of the UK. So is that kind of justification for the defence issue that, in fact, it doesn't actually, from that point of view, it doesn't matter what's spent in Scotland if you're arguing that all UK defence expenditure is for the benefit? From a public uh, finances point uh, of view, but I would just like to clarify, uh, uh, for GDP and employment uh, yeah, yeah, and all of that, yeah. that's about what's produced uh, in Scotland right. or the employment uh, that's in uh, Scotland. But would so, that be a break on on trying to find out the answer to some of these questions because it would, it would change the rationale for it. I mean, in terms of for the benefit of the people of Scotland, you could argue you don't need to find out how much is actually spent in Scotland. I mean, that's a contentious remark, but somebody could argue that. I think, I think there's, probably, there's probably a distinction here between what we're, we're trying to almost achieve with the data. When uh -huh. we're doing the JERS publication for public finances, we're trying to very much be consistent where possible with wider sort of international standards for doing public finances is tricky because these things about where spending is in or for aren't in that framework, but we're trying to be as consistent as possible. If you're interested in what defence spending, for example, occurred in Scotland, which in itself is a very interesting question, that would more be a question about the economic impact of a spend. So in some ways that would be, it's a wider economic question and the defence spending which occurs in Scotland, again, that's something which we would factor into our GDP estimates, for example, because we're doing GDP, we're very much interested in what occurs in Scotland specifically. So for the defence part, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mary, that would be the defence spending specifically which takes place in Scotland and the wider economic activity associated with it. So there's a slight distinction. It depends what the purpose of the exercise is, really. 
Okay, well, that was interesting. And the third point, well, we're all very interested in VAT now because of the Smith proposal. So, uh, well, it was quite alarming what a small sample it was based on. But I wondered, based on that 500 household survey, I don't know if that's been around for a year or two or not, uh, you know, what kind of, uh, firstly, what kind of comparisons do you get between Scotland and England in terms of household expenditure and therefore VAT? Uh, and secondly, how that's varied over, over the last few years? Share over the last few years, the share of um, Scottish VAT of the of UK VAT um, has been fairly stable over the last few years. Um, so um, it hasn't moved that much in terms of the share that's taken of the UK level. I don't have the um, the English figures um, or the the sort of four nations figures in front of me, but I can certainly send that to the committee um, because obviously. Um, the HMRC, for example, produced those for the, the four parts of the UK. So I can certainly um, uh, show, show the committee some okay. figures on that. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. That appears to have exhausted the questions from members of the committee. I've just got one or two myself just to finish off. And it's just a kind of follow up to some of the questions that have been asked already with regard to HMRC data. One is, um, will you have direct access to HMRC data in terms of the Scottish rate of income tax? Because you talked about some of the sources as coming through the ONS, which, you know, why, why through a third party? Why not directly? Um, with regards to income tax, we're still in discussion of HMRC about precisely what data we can get access to. It's not something I'm personally directly involved in, but my understanding is there is particular restrictions in t for HMRC's ability to share data on individual taxpayers, as it were. So, for example, when data is anonymised, it's much easier to share. When it's got identifying information and such like, there is, again, legislative um, difficulties in being able to share it, not just with ourselves, but even with um, Treasury or anyone else. So, for example, my understanding is that Treasury would not be able to get access to the raw income tax data collected by HMRC for the same reasons, for because it's confidentiality more than anything else. So what we're doing just now is we're discussing with HMRC about how we can get anonymised data and again, those discussions are ongoing just now. Okay, when you get that data, will the Scottish Fiscal Commission then have access to it? Um, I would, I would assume so. Again, I think it, 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 the discussions are ongoing, so I mean, there may well be issues about how the data can be shared more widely, and I, I wouldn't want to prejudge that. But again, our, our our starting point would be that we'd give the Scottish Fiscal Commission access to all the data which they they need. Yeah, it'd be good to get clarification mm -hmm. actually on that. that would be uh, possible. Um, I mean, that's a question uh, from me. I don't want to go back into the Jers thing, although I'm sorely tempted. Um, you know, with all these great mandarins in Whitehall who are benefiting Scotland in terms of our Jers figures, etc., with the money that's spent there. But I won't go into that. I'll just ask uh, one other thing, which is do you have any further points you want to bring to the attention of committee? Um, no, I don't think so. No. Okay, thank that's great. Well, thank you very much uh, for answering our questions, and thank you very much to colleagues for asking them. I'm now going to call a five-minute recess to allow a change of a witness and to allow a natural break for members.
weeks. Um, sorry for the slight delay, the uh, previous session uh, overran. Um, such was the interest of the committee in it. Um, so we'll now continue to take evidence on Scotland's fiscal framework. Uh, I'd like to welcome to the meeting our next panel of witnesses, who are uh, Alan Birmingham of uh, SIPFA, um, Charlotte Barber of ICAS, and Patrick Stevens of the Chartered Institute of Taxation. Uh, members have received um, uh, your excellent written submissions, uh, and so we will move straight to questions from the committee. And the way the committee works is I open up with a few um, introductory uh, and exploratory questions, and then colleagues will drill down uh, in greater depth into those, or perhaps ask completely separate questions as they uh, see fit. So, uh, I think if, where will we start? Well, let's start at um, the Institute of Chartered uh, Accounts of Scotland. And uh, may as well, well, you're in the middle. Don't look so shocked, you knew you were going to be asked something at some point. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm, as I said earlier, all the submissions are actually excellent, but I'm going to uh, go on. Uh, to, I'm going to start with um, a question with regard to the first question that was actually put to ICAS. But before I ask that question, what I would want to to make clear is that if other uh, colleagues on the on the among the witnesses wish to then comment, you don't have to. But if you wish to then comment on the particular issue that I'm raising, please let me know that you wish to comment. So I'm not just asking about your own specific papers. I want this to be a wee bit more interactive. Okay, so uh, in terms of the specific questions, one of the things that I can have said is that, and I quote, ensuring fairness and effective uh, mechanical measures involves significant analytical and statistical input. Fairness may require more detailed calibration of different balancing elements in the Barnett formula adjustments, but the greater the analytical detail and complexity of arithmetical tax adjustments, the more this is likely to reduce transparency. A balance needs to be found between these conflicting aims. And the $64,000 question is, how do we achieve that balance? Uh, I'm not sure is the, the, the short answer. And one of the reasons we've written this and said as much and not given you an answer is I don't think there's a clear-cut answer. I think one of the difficulties, if you look at VAT in the earlier discussions you were having with the previous witnesses, mm -hmm. there's not a, a full range of evidence and... I completely accept that if one really wants to do something, you can do it, and you could pinpoint Sc Scottish VAT if you put your minds to it, with quite a lot of work for civil servants, or with quite a lot of work on the business community, and that has its intricacies as it is when you look at borders already. So somewhere, somehow, there's to be a lot of work done if you want to really identify Scottish VAT uh, and I realise that's the exercise and what one wants to get to. But if it's awfully detailed and then you start working that through your no-detriment Barnett calculations, you begin to lose sight of where you're going, I think. But I don't know quite where you strike the balance between the two. Because if you just took 8% of the economy, it's just a variation on the Barnett for formula already, isn't it? OK, well, I mean, Mr Stevens, you were nodding there. I just wonder if you have anything you want to add to that at all. Um, the only thing that I was going to say was there, is so, there are so many calculations that you could do uh -huh. to this and follow logic because each of them will follow bits of logic that economists, which we are not, um, will be able to come up with and correctly so, but the, end, the bottom line will be that nobody but nobody can get into their minds what has been achieved, I suggest to you. So, I, could I just say, I, I think that part of it will need to be explaining to people, firstly, how the Barnett formula gets there, as well as the adjustments to it, which are set out in the command paper. But then you've got so many choices as to adjustments. Presumably, what we most want to do is to be able to explain to the public why the result we've got to is fair, which mm. is a rather difficult word. And certainly in conversations we've had to date when we're looking at adjustments, the starting point has been that not everybody seems to fully understand how Barnett has arrived at in the first place. Yes, we've had much evidence <laughs> on that sort of issue and worries and I'm sure you can imagine. Mr Birmingham, have you got any comment you want to make from SIPFA's perspective on this? Uh, yeah, I think that uh, the Smith Commission seems to be uh, alluding to a, a simplified route. Uh, by that I mean obviously there will be an initial adjustment 
uh, to the block grant, uh, kind of representing the, the tax foregone in the UK or anything like that. Uh, and then some form of indexation after that to that amount, uh, which would then be fed into the Barnett formula. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm, I think there is great difficulty in measuring this area, but if you take that simplistic approach, like with the income tax one that's in the Smith Commission saying that it will be indexed by sort of uh, uh, the general growth in taxation or whatever in, the, in that respect in the UK, uh, that's a fairly simplistic approach. There's plenty of evidence, I think, from OECD uh, analysis in other countries about how tax sharing arrangements work. So uh, I think there are opportunities to look at that kind of simplified approach and probably uh, an area for someone like the Fiscal Commission or the Joint Exchequer Committee to agree with Treasury on how that approach works. Okay, thank you. I'm going to switch between your papers uh, as we go on here. So, Mr. Stevens, just in terms of your paper, you, um, you, um, you commented in terms of the no detriment principle. There needs to be agreement as to what constitutes uh, no detriment. I'm just wondering uh, what you feel it should constitute no, no detriment. It seems to me that the first year's adjustment will be relatively straightforward. I'm not suggesting it won't entail lots of work and calculations and such like, but you know, detriment, it's simply moving lumps of money from one side of the board to another. I'm very sorry if that's simplistic, but um, it's, it, um, it seems to me that it's after that, the years after that, how you should index or adjust or move in, accord in accordance with the economies of each piece of land mm -hmm. and how those should interact on each other, how that gets you to no detriment is a very difficult thing to say because whatever happens, ju ju just taking Scotland, uh, um, the change, I, I'm going to concentrate on tax just because I'm a tax person, so Absolutely. excuse me. Fine. Um, the changes in tax take will not simply be as a result of changes of rates and thresholds. It will be as a result of changes in economy, changes in behaviour of people. How you split those out in order to try and keep with the principle of no detriment and everything else that we're talking about I think will be a challenge, and the longer it goes on, the more so. Okay, um, Mr. Birmingham, on that issue. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I suppose I, I look at no detriment in two areas, really. One is uh, if you take the, the tax side and what gets shared through departmental expenditure limits through the Barnett formula, and then secondly, uh, the side that is outside of the Barnett calculation. So, for example, any devolved uh, welfare spending that, that you have, which is uh, AMI or an annually managed expenditure and demand-led, uh, and therefore outside of the Barnett formula, that's going to be a more difficult area to actually index going forward. I agree with my colleague that the initial adjustments will be fine. Uh, <clears throat> anything subject to the Barnett formula going forward, I think, is, is coming up with an appropriate uh, indexation measure. Uh, particularly as that's around tax and things like that, uh, I, I think there are relatively simplified measures of tax sharing out there that you could avail of and look at. Uh, the one on Amy is more difficult. I think that example of, say, the growth in welfare spend is, is greater here than it is in the UK. Uh, how you therefore index that going forward, which is non-Barnet formula driven, uh, that becomes more difficult. Uh, and I suppose the only thing I can say on that would be that you need to look at what are the drivers of, of that type of spend. You know, what drives welfare spend primarily in Scotland and so on, and agree that type of measure with Treasury as the way forward to index that. Okay, Ms Barbara, what, what the ICAST believe constitutes no detriment? ICAST hasn't got a view as to exactly what constitutes no detriment. I think ICAST has concerns as to how it will eventually be defined because it, it could be quite high level and just pitch it in year one 
uh, in broad terms, or I've heard quite a few conversations where it's taken a lot further. So, for instance, say in the UK there was a, a radical change to the personal allowances. That would have a knock-on effect into how much Scottish rate of income tax you might be collecting. And if that's the case, is that no detriment or is the Scottish rate of income tax a partially devolved tax? So there's been a kind of joint decision to go there, perhaps? I don't know whether it would constitute no detriment or not. And that's something I think would have to be agreed as part of the overall package. OK. And, Mr Bemmy, did you want to come back on that particular uh, point? <clears throat> well, I think it's important to recognise that, you know, one area of difficulty with, OK, no detriment, uh, as my understanding means, that uh, the overall position in the UK, including Scotland, will not change. Just the share between uh, Westminster and Scotland will change. Uh, now, if you took that in the context of you're still retaining the Barnet formula for a vast bulk of your spend, uh, you know, that, to me there's a, a real difficulty there in that the Barnet formula doesn't really work uh, with the devolved powers that you're getting, and particularly if you go for further increased devolved powers in the future, like, say, Northern Ireland having corporation tax abilities and things like that. Uh, and there does seem to be, uh, obviously pressure to move that way, uh, the Barnett formula becomes less and less relevant, really, uh, and becomes obsolete in the way it works. And, and in my view, you know, wouldn't give that kind of accountability that you're looking for uh, in terms of being accountable to uh, the people of Scotland for tax raising and for the resulting spending from those taxes. OK, then Mr Birmingham, let's stick to, to your own paper. Um, yeah. You've got a section called The Practical Impact of Additional... Uh, Fiscal powers, in paragraph 2.3, you say, and I quote, the majority of Scotland's income will still be in the form of the block grant with the accompanying restrictions and limitations on financial planning and management, such as no, en no end of year flexibility and the lack of ability to decide reserves. Um, I mean, given the, the way this is uh, written and the, the kind of thrust of that, do you believe, therefore, that these kind of uh, restrictions should be loosened somewhat, and how should they be loosened, if so? Uh, I, I do believe they should be, yes. Uh, I know you have the ability for essentially what Treasury call a rainy day uh, fund uh, to build up, but it's quite small. Mm -hmm. uh, End of year flexibility does lead, obviously, in its simplest terms, to the position where uh, perhaps years and years ago the public sector was always accused of rushing to spend its budget in March, uh, and lack of end of year flexibility kind of encourages that regime. Uh, if you had more power over reserves and the ability to designate reserves and things like that, uh, that would give you the ability to, you know, encourage longer term planning. Uh, uh, and that's really the thrust of that comment, is that if you're looking, you know, to develop a fiscal framework, that should be aimed at medium to longer term planning. Uh, and one of those fiscal levers, therefore, will be the ability to designate your own reserves and hold reserves, and therefore plan better for those longer term projects and things like that. What kind of scale of reserves would we be talking about, perhaps? <coughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, that's, that's, I suppose, a question. I mean, if you looked at local government as an example, uh, where they do have a, a fair amount of freedom to hold reserves, uh, it's a it is a balance between what is, you know, essentially making a profit from your council tax and holding the appropriate level of reserves. And, and that, uh, in a sense, makes the elected representatives in the local authority accountable for that. So I think that's one of those prudential-type measures that's included in a prudential-type regime, uh, a framework of what is actually the right level of reserves uh, and what's too much. Uh, you know, I don't have a particular view on that, and there isn't much evidence to, at a sort of central government level to say what that is. Uh, at local government level, I know I'm based in Belfast. I mean, the kind of edict out there is about sort of, you know, 5% of their the kind of rate space and things like that. But there's not a lot of empirical evidence to say that's the appropriate level. It's just kind of a, a guideline, really. OK, Ms Barber, do, do you have any comments to make? Or Mr Stewart? OK, that's fine. I'm got, I'll, I'll move on then, again, switching papers to uh, your own, uh, the, the ICAS uh, paper again. And you see, uh, and I quote, uh, you've, you've got a, a, a very um, um, big section on... Um, 
preventative spend. That's a very interesting section. I'm sure colleagues will want to drill down into that in some detail. But just to open that issue up, uh, you say, and I quote, preventative spending, like capital spending, is about investing in the future. We believe this provides clear justification for the extension of the Scottish Government's revenue borrowing powers to fund, fund preventative spend initiatives within prescribed limits. And I'm just wondering what those limits would be. I'm not going to commit myself to any limits. One of my colleagues wrote this section, and I think when we discussed with your clerk about coming here, uh, the, my colleague who is involved in this wasn't able to attend today, mm -hmm. uh, and I, we can certainly get you more written evidence if you would like on it, or somebody could attend on a different date if you would like. I'm a tax person. Preventative spend's not my cup of tea. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm sorry about that. I was just going to, I'm I was, sorry. I was going to do a wee follow-up there, and then I wonder if you could maybe give me some information on that. If not, we could get some yeah. follow-up information, which is just, and you say again in the report, the debt financing by, of charities by government is a potential model for providing working capital to charities for preventive spend initiatives. And it was just to ask if you could tell us a wee bit more about that. I'll put that, that in the follow-up. Uh, okay, uh, uh, that's that's fine. Okay, um, I'm just wondering um, uh, then in terms of the. Oops, I can get back to my uh, report, basically. Um, in terms of um, uh, your um, uh, submission, actually, um, Mr Stephen, I'm just wondering, uh, you talk about um, uh, encompassing tax competition, just to go back a wee bit to no detriment. I'm just wondering if you, how you feel about the issue of tax competition, you know, as a, as a tax man, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, 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 do you feel it's a good thing, is it a bad thing? Uh, and, and where would it fit in in terms of these uh, proposals? Um, I certainly do not have a view that it is good or bad. Um, I do strongly believe that the world is full of tax competition uh, between countries. Everywhere you look, if you've spent your life uh, advising companies that trade across borders, Tax competition is rife and it has been for a lot of years now and grows all of the time. Um, and certainly uh, on the subject that we have today, I believe that it is completely inevitable that there will be a growing element of tax competition north and south of the border. Um, even if no one intends it to be, even if that is not the driver in any way for any of changes of tax law, um, as soon as those bits of tax law move out of sync with each other, you are just creating tax competition. And, and uh, as soon as, a, a few years ago, when the whole of these, this sort of question started arising, rates of income tax, Scottish rates of income tax, everything. The very, very first uh, thing was, so that's another bit of country tax competition that there is going to be. Okay, thank you uh, for that. Um, Ms Barber, your tax expert, how do you feel about tax competition? I, 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 I'm exactly the same as Patrick. I, I, I don't have views on whether it's good or bad. I mean, it is. And as long as you've got different rates, different regimes, distinctions, there will always be a difference. And it's, it's part of what people say are attractive about a tax regime, aren't they? That it's lower or more simple or whatever the case might be. Uh, I think it's quite difficult and you have to pick tax competition out from uh, tax incentives. You have to pick it out from tax avoidance because, of course, if you have competition, then one element's going to be avoiding the higher one, isn't it? That's another side of it they're all tied up together and where they separate themselves from no detriment i'm not sure either okay uh, mr berman do you have a view on this at all uh only in the context of as you said no detriment uh <coughs> that kind of tax competition is going to be very difficult to try and assess uh so i think if treasury uh felt there was some kind of uh, detriment for them or adverse impact uh, I would see that it's almost impossible to kind of prove that. Uh, you might be able to take a view in terms of companies' tax but, uh, and corporation tax, but as an individual, uh, I would say that's almost impossible to measure, really. Uh, so I think the no detriment issue is going to be the mm -hmm. difficulty there with tax competition. We've heard a number of examples of, say, air passenger duty 
Are you going to use it in a tax competitive fashion to make Scottish airports more attractive, or will the north of England do it? Is that no competition, or is I mean, is it tax competition, or is it no detriment and it needs to be evened out? Okay, uh, thank you for that. Okay, I'm going to open up the session to colleagues around the table. The first person to ask questions will be Mark. Thank, thank you very much, convener. Actually, um, ju just on the point around um, tax competition, um, one of the things which we've seen very early on with the devolution of the land and buildings transaction tax, as it became uh, not not so much of landfill tax, but was the obviously the autumn statement by the Chancellor, where he made radical changes to stamp duty, um, and that essentially led to a change being made to the rates that, that were applied by the Scottish Government. Now, one of the precursors to that was obviously the processes here in Scotland were that the Scottish Government consulted uh, early on the rates that they were going to apply, whereas the way that the UK uh, budget system works, the Chancellor can just stand up and say, I'm doing this and it happens at midnight. Do you foresee that as tax devolution becomes more prominent and more prevalent, there needs to be a look at how the systems work uh, to ensure that such processes don't, you know, so you don't have essentially the rug being pulled out from under the feet of a devolved administration in that same way. Well, whoever wants to take it first. Just, I'll start. You can. <laughs> uh, just as a point uh, to start with, that is not what I particularly had in mind as tax competition. That that was, in a way, uh, and please excuse this, political competition between two chancellors, if you like. Um, what I think of as tax competition is where you are attracting individuals, businesses, activities to one location or another. Okay. I'm just, uh, that's just sort of a, a, a piece of conversation, as it were. But, but presumably, though, the principle still applies in terms of Scottish government um, consults ab on rates, whereas so, so, at a UK level, the, there is the rabbit out of the hat I, approach. Taken. I was then about to try and answer your, your sure. question, um, which is I, I do think it's going to be an interesting journey for each set of lawmakers as to particularly if they do get into the mindset that this is going to be tax competition, um, because I, d I don't think many people are thinking of it in that way at the moment. It's, it's just a, 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 at first it will be more of an unintended consequence. Um, from following policies that people think are right for their part of the UK. Um, but I'm simply saying it will then turn into tax competition because that's life. Um, I will be quite surprised if the UK method of announcing such changes alters hugely mainly because it's not particularly Scotland that they would normally have in mind. Um, that's not who they will be thinking of as who they want to compete with in attracting, for example, businesses or high-income people into the rest of the UK. And so the fact that Scotland happens to work things through more of a consultation process, I don't think will impact them greatly. I'll, I'll make no comment on the possibility that a Tory government might not think of Scotland, but perhaps uh, Barbara would want I'm, to. Um, I've, I'm, please, I'm, I do I'm, not I'm, wish to I'm, go there. I'm merely being <laughs> flippant. <laughs> Ms Barbara. Yeah, we won't go there. I, I would agree that I think the SDLT move was quite political and I think it probably had a, a different impact because LBTT was coming in as a new tax here. So that was the first settling down. But I don't think that the Scottish taxes can go radically differently from UK taxes. And I'm sure there'll always be a tendency to pull together <laughs> as there is with the landfill tax just now. Uh, in terms of process... We, as tax practitioners, we frequently ask for further consultation at the UK level. We've never had it on rates and bans and things like that, and I don't think we'll ever get it. It's a political lever, and it's not something that we would actively lobby for or comment on. And we didn't comment on LBTT rates, for instance, because, again, rates are not something that tax practitioners 
said, we work with the legislation as it comes to us, uh, and we'll come to you if we think the legislation is difficult to work with. We do like the consultative processes here, and they've been really helpful. Uh, so it'll be interesting, and I think it sits with you as to whether the processes around your rates will need to differ. I mean, I've heard plenty of commentary that you don't have an annual finance bill. Uh, whether we want one is a moot point, but maybe the processes will need to change as part of the overall fiscal framework. I don't know, if Mr Birmingham, if you have anything to add on this particular issue. Um, well, I'd agree with colleagues that I don't see the process changing per se. Uh, I do think that, uh, you know, Northern Ireland, say, where they have corporation tax legislation, uh, again, they don't see it as a tax com... Well, I suppose they do in the sense that their main driver for that was competition with the Republic of Ireland on their rate uh, and to attract foreign direct investment. Uh, I suppose primarily the latter, you know, that, that was the key driver to get foreign direct investment in... Uh, I, I think your competition, if you took that analogy, you know, between your closest, nearest neighbours, uh, therefore you might see some marginal adjustments to tax and slight differences appearing, but I agree that I don't see a, a huge, significant material difference coming in the near future, uh, so I don't see that, you know, I think the process here and the process there will, will evolve, as, as colleagues have said. One of the... the concerns that has been raised during the the examination of the powers that are to come or proposed to come through Smith and, and the draft clauses is around um, the, the very narrow control that the Scottish Government would have over the tax rates. For example, um, the, the, the suggestion has been made that were a future Scottish Government to take a decision to perhaps in, uh, reintroduce a 50 pence top rate, because they wouldn't have control over all of the areas uh, of taxation, individuals could apportion that to, for example, bonuses or dividends, and it would not be touchable by the, the, the Scottish government under that regime. Is that something you have a concern with uh, in terms of how, how effective future tax powers could be in Scotland? I would suggest that if there's wild, if there's major differentiations, it comes back to that tax competition point. If there's significant differences, tax competition, tax planning, uh, doing your best not to pay too much, whatever it's called, uh, people will use what's available. I, I think that's just the nature of people, and certainly it, it can be used in people's favour as well if you look at ISAs and savings, for instance. I, I, I think the suggestion was that there would be the potential creation of a loophole existing in Scotland, I, which I did not perhaps exist in other parts of the UK that people could use in order to perhaps lower their tax liability? I'm not sure that I would call it a loophole as such. Uh, it, it just is what it is. And there is the potential for family-owned companies, directors, if they own a company, it's, it's a perfectly legitimate business decision as to whether you pay yourself a salary and or dividends and, to a certain extent, how you, you know, what proportion you use. It will be the case that dividends fall to UK tax, salaries will fall to Scottish rate. Sorry. Only as a follow-up and agreeing with, with what Charlotte's saying, um, it's only going to make any difference, to state the obvious, if the two sets of rates start to differ by a lot. If they do, then you will have a number of questions arising, and the one that you're talking about, I accept that that will raise some interesting questions in the sort of way you're saying I'm agreeing with you. Mm. Okay. Mr. Birmingham? Uh, <clears throat> nothing further to add in, in terms of what the two colleagues have said. Okay. Thank you. Malcolm, to follow by Gavin. The um, Chartered Institute of Taxation, um, no, sorry, ICAS, <laughs> uh, there's an interesting page about VAT, which we've discussed quite a bit today already, and Obviously, you, you point out the options of production-based and consumption-based, although it appears to be moving towards consumption-based, I think, from the last panel that would confirm that, I think. But, but, but what I was interested in, really, was your comment about the no detriment in VAT, because I, can't, I hadn't kind of thought of those two uh, as being connected. I, I thought of no detriment in other contexts, but you're saying any decision on the calculation of the VAT assignment also needs to be informed how the no detriment principle we, will be applied. So... Could you kind of um, open that up a bit and, so I can appreciate the significance of that? I just think 
uh, it depends on how you calculate it and then it'll wash through because however your calculations are going to go into your barnet adjustment aren't they and then flowing through from that you've to unpick the bits as to what relates to economy and what relates to Scottish measures in order to continually to balance your Barnet formula adjustments in future. Okay, I'll have a think about that. Thank you. Um, I, I mean, I take your point about um, preventative spend that somebody else, but, but I think if, if you are writing us to about that, I mean, I think the main yeah. question in my mind when I read that, which I found an interesting suggestion and not one which I oppose, but I think the problem that we've grappled with in other contexts is how do you define preventative spending? So I, I imagine that would be one of the objections to Bring it from, from those who didn't support that. So it would, it would be interesting to get your thoughts on that as well. And at the end of your paper, you seem to be questioning the independence of the Fiscal Commission. Well, you say it's independent is not necessarily obvious if it is a part of the Scottish administration. And when one of its proposed functions is to prepare such reports as Scottish ministers may require, so do you think its status ought to be changed in that way? Or? I, there are two, perhaps two points there. Firstly, I think in terms of the wider public, mm -hmm. I, I completely accept that the way the draft legislation is structured at the moment, that the Scottish Fiscal Commission would be independent mm -hmm. of the Scottish Government. But it's quite a kind of technical independence and I'm not sure that if you've got something sitting in the middle of the Scottish administration that to the wider public they see the distinctions within there so and it needs to be seen to be independent I think if independence is what you want. Uh, okay thank you now one of our other obsessions obviously is the block grant adjustment so if I could ask the other two panel members about that the um, Chartered Institute of Taxation I've got it right this time has interesting comments about that, well, from, from in sections five and six, really, of the paper. Now, 5.3 talks about index deduction and levels deduction. So presumably we're getting index deduction. Could, could you explain what you mean by levels deduction? Uh, I am now going to duck on this one. Uh, what we have tried to do in our response to you is mm. to indi uh, we, we talked to various of our colleagues and, and people in close organisations and have tried to point towards some helpful things to be looked at here. Um, however, you have now got a tax person uh, and this is deep in the field of economics. I will happily write you a note uh -huh. on the subject. Of course I will. But um, I'm ducking at this moment. And, and does that relate to, to your comment in 6.3 as well? Because obviously well, we accept we're getting the index method, but one concern is obviously that the tax spend areas in Scotland and the rest of the UK might diverge for reasons unrelated to Scotland's policy. So would, would you want to pass on that one as well? Uh, well, uh, I will, but uh, just let me come at you for yeah, just a couple of sentences, yeah, uh, if I may. Uh -huh. Um, it is something that we were touching on earlier oh, right. in, uh, this morning. Oh. Um, the different elements oh. that go into the change in um, tax take will be enormously diverse and, and behavioural change will be one of them. Mm. You just go back to the uh, dividend and, and thing that we were talking about earlier. But there will be a whole load of behavioural change if rates go a lot different from each other. And this is simply suggesting that how exactly you get to these adjustments to the block grant w will need to be the subject of lots more negotiation now before you get there. OK, thank you. That's helpful. Oh, well, yeah, OK, yeah, that would be good. Uh, yeah, just on the, the Barnet formula, really, I suppose the way I see this moving forward is, uh, well, <laughs> the Barnet formula really uh, is the mechanism for adjusting uh, essentially what is called consequentials, really. Uh, so where Westminster spend rises or falls, uh, how comparable that is, i.e. in terms of that's uh, a devolved uh, function or whatever, uh, uh, then uh, whatever percentage is devolved is times by a population uh, 
based percentage to get you a Barnet consequential. So back in the 70s, you had a, a fixed budget, and ever since then, the Barnet formula has been applied to those consequential adjustments. Uh, what we seem to be moving to is a situation where in this additional measure now, so whatever adjustment comes through the devolved powers that you're going to get in terms of uh, uh, tax foregone or spending that is being transferred <coughs> and associated savings, what Treasury would do in their statement of funding policy at budget time and at the autumn statement time would be to list out how that adjustment would work in their statement of funding policy. So I assume that there's going to be a little bit of an adjustment to uh, the section that covers Scotland's consequentials, uh, saying that this space figure needs to be taken out and then indexed by wh whatever that index is, uh, and then that's the amount of consequential you get. Uh, now, I suppose to me that First of all, the thing that shrouds Barnet in mystery is, is that uh, it's done behind closed doors in Treasury. Uh, <clears throat> and so there's very little input into uh, the issues about uh, what is applied on a devolution basis. Uh, the classic example being the Olympics, where Treasury said that benefited the whole of the UK. Uh, and therefore, there was no consequential adjustment for all the increased spending on the Olympics, even though you may well have, have spent some money locally in terms of maybe even supporting teams that were based in Scotland or something like that. Uh, and that would have come out of your own pocket rather than got any Westminster funding for that. So that's an example of how it can kind of uh, work incorrectly or, or not in your favour. I think there's an issue for the Joint Exchequer Committee or perhaps the Fiscal Commission uh, to be involved with Treasury uh, so as you can actually agree in advance of that funding statement being produced exactly what the indexation measures are and what the impact of that will be on the Scottish budget. Yeah, I mean, I take your point on that, but, but, but in your earlier contribution, you seem to be implying that the Barnett formula would wither away, and I, I didn't quite follow your logic there because there are these grey areas that always have been. <coughs> well, they're not going to change, but surely yeah. there will still be a notional consequentials, and then you, you would, in principle, deduct <coughs> whatever you were supposed to be raising in tax from that. So I, I don't quite see how, in principle, the Barnett formula would wither away until such times as if they arise when we raise all, all, the, all, all the money that we spend. I suppose when I say <coughs> wither away, what the Institute's position would be is that it's no longer fit for purpose uh, as we move further down the devolution route particularly, uh, and therefore should be withdrawn and replaced with something else that's a bit more needs-based. Uh, that would be the Institute's view on it. So withering away is probably the wrong thing to say, because obviously there would be something in its place, but... What we're suggesting is that something would be more needs-based rather than based on a uh, just a consequential adjustment of something that was set up in the 1970s. So, so that's your opinion, but it, it, it's not. It, it, it needn't weather away as a matter of fact. It could still survive, but your 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 own view is it shouldn't. Sort of. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, uh, Gavin. Followed by John. Thank you. Um, first question is just a follow up on the VAT assignment uh, from the from the ICAS paper. The paper talks about um, dividing up by place of production or place of consumption, and that has been put before this committee before. In, in your view, do we have a, a simple choice between those two options, or is there some kind of hybrid option between the two that's possible, or, or is there a simple case you've got to either decide you're going production? <laughs> or you, well. Uh, <laughs> I think both choices have their difficulties. I don't. VAT is what we call an indirect tax. It's, it's not directly on the economy in the, as endless stages in it, doesn't it? Or if you do it on a consumption basis, it's not necessarily being made here. So I think it's really difficult. Uh, I quite see the sense of a hybrid kind of position because it might cut out the worst of both or it might add the worst of both. I, I'm not sure that I completely find VAT assignment an easy thing to marry up to the Scottish economy. Okay. Don't know if others have views. I mean, is it a simple choice between the two, or is there, is there some other system that we've not thought about yet? Well, if it is, I haven't either. Okay. Right. But, um, I mean, 
on the assumption, a big assumption, that we're all going to remain part of the EU, um, it seems to me that the whole thing is going towards consumption um, and, and is, is sort of mooring there. Um, and that was the theory that I had always assumed we would get to. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr Birmingham, you made a, an interesting comment earlier. I mean, the block grant adjustment is not an easy subject. We've, we've seen that over the last uh, couple of years, or particularly the last couple of months. But you suggested it would become even trickier. I mean, so far we've only looked at block grant adjustment for Dell, not for, for EME. You touched on how you might have to think about it for EME. Can you just expand on that just a little bit more? Because, I, I mean, we've talked about it a lot for Dell, but we've never really discussed how you do a block grant adjustment for EME. Are there any other factors we should be thinking about that you, you didn't mention earlier? Well, that's the first point, is that uh, EME's not driven by the block grant process and the Barnett formula, and that's purely Dell. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, what could happen, I suppose, is the position where you've got to devolve welfare spend and that either accelerates or slows at a different rate to the UK. Uh, <clears throat> and thinking about the no detriment principle of, of how you would adjust for that if the overall uh, position is financially going to be the same, you know, it would allude to the fact that if, let's say, your welfare spend was increasing at a significantly different rate to the Westminster's, you would need uh, the indexation or whatever the process is in place for adjusting the Amy spend to reflect that. Uh, now, that's a, a more difficult measure, in my view, than just simply saying, uh, like on a tax basis, you know, income tax, this is the amount that the UK is foregone, and we're going to index it by the general uplift in the tax base in the UK or something like that. Uh, because that Amy spend is, can be disproportionate, that makes the adjustment more difficult. You can't apply a kind of flat index. That's why I was suggesting you might need to look at what the drivers of welfare spend are to be able to... Uh, create an index that that kind of fits that that bill. Okay. Thank you. Um, question for everyone, really, but I'll, uh, Mr. Bang, I'll start with you again because you talked about it. In terms of borrowing powers, because you all touched on borrowing powers in your papers, if you put preventative spend to, to one side for now, because I, I accept you, we'll get a, perhaps some more details on that. But in terms of borrowing for other purposes or, or specifically for capital, do, do you have views? on what the regime ought to be. Should, I mean, I think you suggested it's it's kind of rainy day uh, money in terms of existing. Obviously, you, you then think it should be more than that, but, but by how much more? Do you, do you have a view on how much it ought to be? Should there be limits at all, or should there be a sort of, um, you know, an, an unlimited um, uh, opportunity in it, and then it, you know, the markets, I guess, effectively um, regulate you in, in some way? Do, do you have views on, on what sort of borrowing regime we ought to have in place? Uh, well, yeah, I think that uh, in terms of limits, I'll come to that in a minute, but yeah, uh, the Smith Commission was alluding to the fact that you should have some kind of prudential measures uh, of borrowing to support your borrowing powers. Now, Treasury have put a kind of ceilings on your borrowing levels of 2.2 billion uh, and things like that. Uh, in the context, I suppose, this needs to be seen in the context of your framework supporting a market view. If, if you ever came to issue bonds or anything like that in the market, you would need some kind of credible fiscal framework and regime to support that, and that kind of supports your case and, and impacts on the interest rates and things like that that you may get. Uh, the prudential regime would suggest that uh, what you should be doing is, is uh, agreeing what's an affordable borrowing limit. So in that sense, there isn't a dictated limit, but you as the elected representatives would agree what an affordable borrowing limit is. Now, affordability is kind of seen in the context of, of, of how much, uh, what's the impact of that on the local tax base that you're, you're raising. So is, say, 25% of the local tax revenues that you're raising being spent on financing borrowing? You know, is that acceptable? Uh, and you as elected representatives would have to come up with what is the affordable level that we want to put in place and agree and perhaps legislate through uh, the annual budget process or something like that, that that is the affordable limit we're going we're to stick to. 
uh, and therefore the market and others can see that that's the, that's the kind of uh, debt to GDP level or whatever that ratio is that the Scottish Government are aiming for and that's budgetary what they put in place and that, that fits in with having a fiscal framework, that sort of regime. So I think that's the appropriate way to go in that context. Okay, and I wonder if other panellists have, have views on borrowing. The only point that I would make in addition is that on the assumption that the Scottish Government borrowing was being underwritten by the whole of the UK, I suggest there is not quite the same link between levels of borrowing and what the market thinks of it, because logically the market would look upon it as simply being part of all UK debt. Therefore, if that is going to be the case, it would seem to me that the amounts of borrowing need to be primarily agreed between uh, the two governments, if I can put it in that way. Based on many of the principles that we were talking about there, I was just saying the market wouldn't have the same effect um, in that case. Say, yeah. One thing to say is, obviously, if you're still uh, kind of just uh, fiscally federal, shall we call it, uh, so under Westminster, then obviously Westminster could have a backstop of imposing a limit on you should you, you know, kind of uh, really go to town in a way that they fundamentally disagree with. Uh, what I'm talking about is a fiscal framework that gets you towards a position where it fits in with that kind of fiscal federal approach. Uh, but also fits in if you ever went to full fiscal autonomy. You know, you would have that regime already in place. Okay. Um, that's great. Thank you. Keep on that sort of thanks. Deputy Convier. Uh, thank you uh, for that. Um, on, on the question of analysis and forecasting and things like that, um, I mean, ICAS says in paragraph 8, um, Scottish Government are developed to deliver the financial analysis necessary to support policy decisions. Government needs to work out how much tax it will really raise. And the SIPFA, one of your th four critical questions is what is a Scottish Government must be able to answer. What is the fiscal impact if further devolution takes place? But, I mean, if we are subject to making a decision and then, as has been pointed out already, Westminster makes a decision that overrides that, and given the difficulties with the block grant adjustment in that we've already taken on landfill tax and we don't know what 11 months ahead what the adjustment will be for that i mean are these just wishful thinking that we cannot possibly do <clears throat> no i i don't believe so i mean uh the thrust of what we're trying to get to as i say is is a fiscal framework that uh will fully support if you go down the route of further devolution, uh, even towards full fiscal autonomy, in effect. Uh, so that's the type of fiscal framework we're uh, envisaging should be put in place. Uh, in terms of some of the things you've talked about, uh, measuring the impact of these things, that's why I think it's important, we've alluded it, to it in our submission, that Scotland reviews its... Uh, financial management in in the sense that you know like a whole of scotland position having a scottish balance sheet and things like that regularly available for scrutiny to be able to see well if we did take on extra borrowing or if we did that this that and the other that's what the impact of this will be uh, the impact on tax raising the impact on our balance sheet the impact and so on and so forth so uh, bringing in a financial management regime that suits that uh, obviously, looking forward, it is just about prediction. It's a guideline. It's not, you know, an exact science. Uh, so, yes, things will impact you, but that's why we've also alluded to trying to make an assessment of the risks. Uh, I think what we're talking about is a medium to longer term financial plan, which will also feed into any discussions you do have with Treasury. So there's an opportunity to preempt where they may come along and, and do something which has a, a fundamental adverse impact on what your plan is. There's the ability, if you know that up front, to be able to say, well, look, you know, this is the way our plan works. It's based on these assumptions. And if you did that, you know, that would have a, an impact which would be detrimental. Uh, so I think it's about, you know, it's not an exact science. 
I, I can't see how the Scottish Government, you know, can properly manage some of those powers without having that financial management framework in place. That's that's what I would say. So we should do all of that, and then at the bottom of the page, in small letters, you know, this is all subject to nothing nasty happening to us. Well, it, I think the same principle, yeah, the same principle applies in Westminster. But what I'm saying is, if you don't do that, uh, you you know, the impact of Treasury doing something else, uh, you, you, you wouldn't have properly planned for or, or worked out what the risk of that is in advance. That's what I'm saying. So, you See, the fiscal framework should have a legislative basis. Can you just expand on what you mean by that? Uh, <clears throat> in the same way that uh, I talked about Treasury's statement of funding policy, uh, that's driven by their legislative basis. So it sets out that the government must produce a budget, for example, and it must uh, produce this charter for uh, funding statement as well, at, at, at order statement time and at budget time. Uh, and that must set out certain rules, what its fiscal mandate is and things like that. So if you put that in legislation, that makes it uh, a kind of a legal requirement for you to do uh, to update that fiscal framework on a regular basis and to actually... It's in the it's, legislation. It's really the structure that's in the legislation. Not yeah. saying what you've got to balance the budget over six no, years or no. something along those lines. No, that will be included in whatever your funding policy statement is and your fiscal mandate. Uh, the legislation is really saying this is the structure of it and this is what you need to publish and produce. Right. Uh, and I wasn't clear, too, if you were thinking that the Fiscal Commission should be... Um, making the forecasts or just reviewing them in 4.7 it talks about they should be checked things should be checked independently reviewed by the scottish fiscal commission and 5.3 it says commission should provide independent economic and fiscal forecasts uh <clears throat> yeah i mean what we're saying is that i think in the same way the obr uh, produce economic and fiscal forecasts and the government use those uh what we're saying is the government doesn't have to use those. Uh, you know, you could go and do something else. You're taking that as advice and somebody independent is feeding into you those figures. Uh, again, whatever your output is and whatever your decisions are, then there's a role for the Fiscal Commission to review that and say, yes, that makes sense, or, or no, we think that those uh, projections are wrong, or whatever. So what I'm saying is you don't have to take the Fiscal Commission's forecast as read, uh, you, you might well interpret the things differently and come to a different budget decision. Uh, but certainly you've got some input to actually, uh, you know, inform that decision-making in the first place. But, but they're, at the moment they're not making forecasts, are they? No, no, no. not at the moment. No. Uh, but I, I would suggest that you do need that kind of input. Mm -hmm. So to me that would be a role for the Fiscal Commission as well. I mean, I don't know if the other two have any views on that about the Fiscal Commission and... I thought there was a lack of clarity as to whether it was going to be checking forecasting or doing forecasting or maybe something closer to auditing. It wasn't crystal clear from the draft legislation as to exactly what the Fiscal Commission's functions would, would be or quite where they would get. And the other area where we had some uncertainties when we had looked at it was how much they would be working with, say, Scottish rate of income tax and if the stats come from HMRC, if they come from HMRC, uh, whether there'd be duplication of work or if there wasn't duplication, if there was scope to going in contradictory directions, we thought there was perhaps a bit of fine-tuning needed there on the working together areas. Okay. Only to add to that, the, the OBR, it seems to me, work, does a reasonably good job or at the moment. I'm not saying whether their forecasts are good or not, but they are respected. Um, they are accepted as being about the best estimate of everybody, and they are accepted as being largely independent of government. Mm -hmm. I think that's a reasonable place to be, and I had assumed that Scotland would like, in some way, an equivalent. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just wonder if that's going back to what Charlotte Barber said earlier, that they've got the appearance of being independent, whereas, in fact, HMRC told us that most of their information just comes out of HMRC, so they're not really that independent, but they do appear to be. Is that, is that the important thing? I mean, that's, OBR does economic forecasts with information that it gets from wherever, including HMRC. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not sure that... 
I, I think I, HMRC would argue that they basically do the work and OBR just kind of put the icing on. But you wouldn't, you wouldn't agree with that? I, I, I would not accept... I, it's, it's, it's sufficient icing for me to be impressed by their objectivity. Okay. Yes, so did you want to come in, Ms. Barber? So, so. I was just going to say, I think the draft legislation around the Scottish Fiscal Commission, uh, there's quite a bit where Scottish ministers have quite a bit of ability to exercise. Uh, do you know, like they, they have some influence over appointments and that they put them forward. The reports need to go to Scottish ministers before they come to yourselves. Some of those areas don't necessarily lead to independence. It might not be independence that you want either, it might just be that you want them to be impartial. Scotland's quite small. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> right, okay, Mr. Bowman. I do think that the yes. OBR do take a, a wider view than just mm -hmm. Treasury's figures. You know, for example, the Institute for Fiscal Studies and things like that feed into the OBR. So I, I accept what you're saying, and Treasury might have that view, but uh, I do think they are slightly more independent mm -hmm. than you're giving them credit for. But. Okay, fair enough. Um, well, continue with yourself, because uh, we've talked about borrowing earlier on, and um, we've talked about Scottish borrowing, Scottish government borrowing, uh, UK government borrowing. I, I just wonder how, where local government borrowing fits in. I know that's kind of a SIPFA area, uh, because yeah. they've, they've been kind of left out of the equation. But in, a, in one sense, yeah. if we look at Scottish borrowing, well, yeah. we can't totally ignore that local government borrowing's yeah. in there, and they've got more freedom, or it looks like they're going to have more freedom than the Scottish Parliament would have. Uh, how do you see all that tying together? Well, in a sense, they do, and I think that's why it's important that as you get these powers and you've got increased freedom of financial responsibility, that you do take a view on, as I said, the whole of Scotland position, uh, including local government, uh, because that's an important point. If you move towards a fiscal autonomy position, that's the sort of information you'll need to know. You cannot just leave local government out and let them to run on and borrow uh, whatever they can, and leave you in a position where local tax is going to be completely unmanageable going forward. Uh, I'm not saying that you need to step in and put some regime in place over local government. I think the regime's already there, uh, and it works reasonably well. Uh, but you do need to take account of that, particularly if you were like uh, going to a market to issue bonds or anything like that. I think it's important you have a position on what the whole of Scotland's finances are. Uh, before you do Which that. Parliament should get more involved in what local government borrows? <clears throat> uh, not get involved, but I think as part of your financial management, overall, like an overarching view of, of what the total debt of Scotland is, yes, I think you should know that. Yes. Okay. Um, Mr Stevens, in your paper uh, in 3.2, it talks about the Barnett formula and uses the word mechanical, which we've looked at before in the committee, and I have to say I quite like the word mechanical because uh, it suggests that you've set a system in place and it works its way through. Uh, but you also talk about uh, we need to be, there need to be a review of the formula, and that might be on a regular basis and perhaps even an annual basis. And I just wonder how that, that ties in, because on the one hand, I've got a picture of something that kind of churns along for a few years, and on the other hand, something that's always reviewed every year. For the avoidance of doubt, we like mechanical as well. Um, it... it yeah, for a series of reasons. Um, it goes back to something we were talking about a little earlier on this morning. Of, I believe that each year, government of whatever variety will ought to account to the people for what the bottom line is of the block grant which takes account of the Barnett formula and the various adjustments that we've been talking about. And we were talking about how we needed to simplify. You can't go to every, every um, theoretical place that you might. And that shouldn't just apply to the adjustments, but to the formula itself, because it's when, only when you pull it all together that you can present to the outside world why this is the right net amount of money that should be received. Therefore, you are inevitably going to be re-examining what the Barnett formula says as a starting point, because you can't just have a black hole there at the top and then explain in detail adjustments being made, because 
you've still got a fairly black hole at the bottom in that case. I, I think it needs to, that the whole calculation needs to be looked at. Loads of sets of mechanics there to help us towards it, but if you just assume that a big chunk of it is always it's going to be all right every year, uh, I don't think it gets you to the right answer. I just wonder if, if you can look at things too often. I mean, you know, like you dig up a plant to see if it's growing kind of thing. It's, yeah, it, it's, it's possible. I've, I've, the thing that I'm most trying to say is that I do believe that each year the public needs to be satisfied that a bottom line correct amount of money has been received. How you get to be able to do that is probably a matter that the government can best judge because it will need to present it to its population. Yeah. Okay, and just one final point. Um, in 13.1, uh, you talk about Scotland having control of 60% of its spending and 40% of its tax revenues. I was just wondering, if by control, now, does that include VAT, which we would have the money, but we wouldn't have any... You know, control in a sense. I believe that is so, yes. and the the implication of what you're saying, I think, is fair. Right. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Kavina. I just really want to ask one question: um, the no detriment clause. It it has, I, th I think, um, concentrated the minds of lots of people who've given evidence to us and. Um, Charlotte Barbara made reference to the air passenger duty, which others have done too, to as to how that would work. And I wanted to ask you, first of all, do you think it's even possible uh, to adhere to such a clause? Do you think it's there just to kind of temper what people might think to do? Or do you think that it's simply political in order to reassure everybody that whatever outcome of this, we're all going to be the same and live happily ever after? Let me just start. I'm sure my colleagues will have better answers than I. Um, it does seem to me, so day one, or more to the point, year one, the concept of no detriment, I think, is, is um, far more easy to get one's mind around. If you add in the concept of tax competition that we talked about earlier on, which I believe just inevitably will arise. It, it, it's, it's a phrase that is, is meant to be a little bit provocative. Um, tax competition, a no detriment, you could say, are mutually exclusive. Therefore, I think you may have a point. Thank you. I would agree with that. In its broadest terms, clearly, if you're part of a wider picture... You don't want imbalances between the two, but if you take it down to much finer detail, much finer analysis, like the example we had earlier on of if the personal allowance is significantly increased, is that no detriment? Is it competition? Is it political? I would expect something like that to wash through into no detriment, and, and therefore, do you know, we are all the same. Or, or if the UK government... Uh, deliberately had a lower top rate of tax, um, therefore persuading a largish number of extremely high income people to move to their jurisdiction, um, would that be no detriment? Sorry, I'm just trying to give examples. Sure, thank you. There's an element in the no detriment rule f by Treasury that is probably related to EU rules about uh, not creating within the, the UK as a whole particular areas where, you know, there's unfair competition or something like that. Uh, so I think that's part of maybe uh, the argument for a no detriment rule. So I, I wouldn't agree that it's just there for, you know, political purposes. Uh, I think there is some rationale to that. Uh, but I think, yeah, coming up with a, a simple way of adjustment is really the way forward because there are going to be certain areas where <clears throat> I think it's almost impossible to, to measure and judge that because you're assuming, as we've said, that uh, 
these adjustments and, and measures are put in place to achieve something else, like stabilising the economy or economic growth, rather than to create a position where there's tax competition or something like that. So if you stuck with the original driver, there are going to be some areas that are very hard to measure and, and maybe should be left out of areas of indexation or anything like that. And just finally, if I may uh, convene it, on that basis, if, if you see that as um, a, basically a good thing, would you think that there are examples already where we uh, suffer in Scotland where the, there could be correction, for example, in delivering renewable energy? Do you think that the no detriment clause could actually correct a number of, of issues like that? Potentially, yeah. I mean, it's not always going to be a negative thing, as I say, and using the example of, say, welfare uh, and disability uh, allowance and things like that, you know, there are going to be examples where perhaps that that should impact Scotland favourably, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. OK, that appears to have uh, concluded questions uh, from the committee. Just get one thing uh, just to seek clarification on. It's from yourself, Mr Bremming. I mean, you talked about um, uh, the uh, Barnet should be replaced by a needs-based formula. I'm just wondering if that's a, that collective view of the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy. Uh, it is indeed, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We have uh, put a a paper out on that, so uh, it is it is the view of the Institute, yes. And what, what would the impact on Scotland be of that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I suppose, one, uh, if I knew what the needs-based measures would be, then I would be able to tell you exactly. Uh, but as I don't, I don't. Uh, but what I can do is maybe allude to some historical evidence. Now, there would be a suggestion, as you probably are aware of if you've looked at this in the past, mm. uh, that across the three regions, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, Wales would argue that they're underfunded. Uh, Northern Ireland maybe don't have an exact view, but there's a view that Northern Ireland's overfunded, <coughs> and there would be a view that Scotland perhaps is as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the only evidence I have is uh, there's two old studies by Treasury, and they are old uh, and out of date, so I would certainly caveat that, because one goes back to the 70s, one goes back to the 90s. And uh, I did a, a piece of work for the Department of Finance and Personnel Committee in Northern Ireland on their review of the operation of the Barnett formula, and there was a piece of work by uh, Professor Ian McLean which looked at uh, some fairly crude measures of need uh, and all three of those uh, studies kind of roughly correlate with each other uh, and actually suggest that Northern Ireland is, is not too far away from its needs-based level. Uh, Scotland is probably slightly overfunded and Wales is, is definitely underfunded. Uh, so all I can draw, if you were asking me to draw a conclusion from that, is that I couldn't tell you what will happen if it moves to a needs-based formula because that's something that would need to be agreed. There would obviously be a huge transition to, to that, uh, but it would suggest that there would be a, a more of an adjustment in Scotland than perhaps the other two in terms of adverse impact, if, you, if you took those three studies. Okay. But I thought there'd be the biggest adverse impact on London if it was needs-based, given the fact that they suck so much money out of the rest of the, the UK and have so much money in terms yeah, of uh, yeah. everything from, uh, well, the civil service to infrastructure spend, but um, mm -hmm. we'll leave it at that. Is there any further points that uh, our witnesses would uh, like to make before we wind up this session? Okay, well, that's great. Well, I'd like to thank you very much, actually, for your contributions today. That was very helpful to the committee. I'm going to call a recess until noon and uh, to allow a changeover of witnesses and a natural break for members. Thank you.
start at noon and we've gone beyond that so let's uh, fire, fire on. Um, Okay, our final business today is to take uh, evidence in relation to the Care of Scotland Bill's financial memorandum from the following Scottish Government officials, uh, Fee Hodgkiss, Lynn Lavery, Maura Oliphant and Julie McKinney. Uh, members have received copies of all written evidence received along with a briefing paper, so we'll move straight to questions from the committee and as you know I will start off with some uh, opening questions and the colleagues will explore um, uh, some of these issues raised in depth. So, first question I would be is, well, I'll set out... Um, Basically, policy memorandum, just uh, for, for uh, the record, um, states that the intentions are that carers should, and I quote, be better supported on a more consistent basis so that they continue to care, if they so wish, in good health and to have a life alongside caring, and that young carers should have a childhood similar to their non-carer peers. So questions will be, obviously, uh, in relation to that uh, uh, context. Um, so let's uh, let's start straight away. I mean, part two of the financial memorandum uh, contains two estimates for areas of expenditure that do not appear to be included uh, in calculating the total figures set out. These are costs for NHS Education Scotland, uh, Scottish Social Services Council for training directly associated with the bill, and awareness raising indirectly associated with the bill, and costs for the third sector indirectly associated with the bill's implementation. So I'm just wondering if you can comment on that. Yes, I can. Good, good afternoon, uh, convener. Good afternoon, uh, committee. The costs for um, training and development to be taken forward by NHS Education for Scotland and Social Services Council are included within the financial memorandum with one of the tables near the beginning, and so are the costs for um, the third sector development. I think the confusion may have arisen because those costs for NES, SSSC and the third sector don't carry on to 2020-21 and the costs presented within the paper that, that you have are the costs from um, are in 2021. So, that, so that's the reason the costs are there. Um, Clarification now. One issue um, which has come up, and, and I'll just t uh, quote uh, the submission from North Eastern Council, which is where I, uh, my own constituency is in, is in terms of the adult care support plan. Um, according to North Eastern Council, um, well, the financial mem memorandum states demand will peak at 34%, uh, and uh, that's uh, made clear uh, in, in page 5 of the memorandum. Um, they say that at present 53% of local carers would be eligible for an ACSP in terms of North Ayrshire uh, and that this would um, mean that six uh, full-time equivalent additional staff would have to be uh, required. Um, and so they go on to say basically that uh, for, um, also that for children and younger adults um, the, th the three years in terms of this additional support funding appears too low. And once a uh, carer has an expectation that will receive a sum of money to purchase support, it cannot be time limited, um, and therefore there will be um, pressures on forthcoming years on carer support within limited budget constraints. So all in all, what they're seeing quite clearly is that the additional work and associated costs estimated uh, are too low, um, and they've talked about it being unrealistic, etc. So I wonder if you can comment on that, because a number of organisations appear uh, cause like etc. Uh, appear to have said that. Now I will say before you answer, there is a caveat in that uh, you know whenever a bill comes forward to this committee, uh, um, I can't remember an occasion when people did say that uh, you know that the funding was exactly right and that that, that you know that uh, everything was hunky dory. But that not being the said, there did do appear to be substantial concerns about some of these issues. I wonder if you can. Uh, talk me through how you came up with the, the, the figures that you have in terms of the, with the adult and young carers. Yes, um, it, it would be good, certainly, if there was a, a meeting of minds around the, around the financial estimates. I'm sure the, the committee uh, would, have, would have welcomed that. Uh, but the, the financial memorandum is based on um, the best estimates uh, possible, um, and I think we have to acknowledge nonetheless that there are difficulties in um, calculating and estimating demand. It's, it's not an exact science by, by any means, it, it, it is a very grey area, and to a great extent the demand will, be, um, will depend on um, carer behaviour and what predicts carer behaviour. 
There will also be issues around, around um, the publication of the bill, uh, uh, local campaigning, uh, peer-to-peer uh, references from carer to carer and so on. All of these have a, a bearing on, on demand. The bill isn't, I mean, the Scottish Government wants to be ambitious ab about the bill, certainly, but um, that ambition shouldn't be equated with unrealistic uh, expectations about a demand profile. In relation to the figures you've quoted, uh, I think, you know, they, they are important. Um, this, this is from one council only, and but nonetheless, it's, it's very important to recognise what the council is saying. Um, it certainly come to our attention through submissions in response to the Scottish Government's consultation that uh, another, a, a number of other local authorities take a different view about, about the demand profile and, and that there will be a slower build-up in demand than a peak from year one. Um, we wouldn't expect carers to come forward in a large number from from year one of, of the bill's implementation. I think the figures quoted uh, were around the numbers of carers that may be known to that particular council because they are known by association in relation to the, the cared for person. But that doesn't equate to carers therefore wanting an adult carer support plan. Certainly within the bill, there's also a duty to um, offer for councils, local authorities to offer a, an adult carer support plan as well. But we, we know from um, research that not all carers will want um, well, what is now called the carer's assessment, that, that um, some carers, a proportion of carers are content and happy with inputting into the community care assessment or the disabled child's assessment of the of the cared for person. So, you know, I think for a good number of reasons that um, that the figures um, could be quite different from, from that stated from, from that local authority, albeit that what they have said is, is important in its, its own right. But we do know that carers decline the offer of a carer's assessment as well. We very much hope that, that, that carers, uh, when, when they want an adult carer support plan, that, that they will come forward. But we, we, we don't quite see it in terms of those figures presented um, in, in that way. Does anybody have anything else to, to add? Well, I'm always interested in what this particular authority says, because it's my own little authority apart from anything else. But what they've said is that, uh, that the, the, the Scottish Government's view is not based on evidence. And you talked about realism, but COSL itself in, in, in you know, subsection 6 of uh, paragraph 5 in their own submission says that uh, unit costs for support to carers are also unrealistic. And they go on to talk about the fact that in England, the government assumes that £967 is the average cost per year for carers requiring short breaks respite, whereas it's only £300 in terms of this legislation. That's quite a significant difference, is it not? Of the unit costs for support, as opposed to the unit costs for the adult carer support plan or the young carers statement, the Scottish Government used the figure of £333 as a, as a unit cost for support. Uh, it is based on uh, fairly recent publication research from, from the Carers Trust and it also, um, is, is, it's also a figure which exceeds um, many of the Time to Live grants. The Time to Live is one of the programmes under the Voluntary Sector Short Breaks Fund where uh, carers get a, a, a grant d directly um, and, and able to, for, for them to purchase what, what they so wish, um, including, including short breaks and especially short breaks. So that's where the, the £333 comes from. The figure quoted of, um, in the English impact assessment of uh, over £900 for, for respite, yes, that's right. If we were to include um, a similar figure in Scotland for respite care, it, it would be over £600 rather than over £900 um, being the, 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 the national um, care contract figure for residential care. So that would be the figure. 
But the reason that we haven't included those figures in terms of respite care or replacement care is that the Scottish Government, uh, with COSLA and others, is looking at the issue of waiving of charges, um, which I can speak about later, and that does have a, an impact. But I'd also like to add that even though the um, Scottish Government hasn't included within the financial memorandum uh, a figure for respite, which uh, would have been over £600 in the latter years um, of, the, of the demand profile, taken on a pro rata basis, the resources uh, for Scotland on a pro rata basis are actually more than um, those for England. But I should add there's a caveat about that uh, because the English Care Act um, deals with uh, adult carers of adults, whereas um, the Carers Bill deals with adult carers of adults and uh, adult carers of children and young carers. Thank you for that. Now, COSL will also say uh, in paragraph 9 that although the Scottish Government indicated it would be prepared to consider any new information which comes to light about the cost estimates, uh, this willingness did not extend to being prepared to jointly agree revised estimates or to addressing unfunded pressures on councils that result from this uh, new legislation. And uh, uh, the National Carers Organisations in their submission says, I quote, we believe the government should undertake fuller scoping on the financial impact of the Carers Bill in section uh, 1.3. Um, to go back to COSA, they say that, uh, that they're calling on the Scottish Government to work with us to reach joint agreement on the model to be used to estimate cost and demand. And again, they add um, COSLA uh, uh, in their conclusion, paragraph 12, that uh, many of these concerns are shared by relevant professional associations such as Social Work Scotland and to an extent by third uh, sector colleagues. So there really seems to be con concerns about some of these financial assessments. And just the National Carers Organisations that I, I quoted, um, you know, uh, that's, uh, there's a, a number of organisations included in that, such as Carers Scotland, Coalition of Carers in Scotland, Minority Ethnic Carers, uh, of Older People's Project, Carers Trust Scotland, Scottish Young Carers Services Alliance, Crossroads Caring Scotland and Shared Care Scotland. So there seems to be quite a, a, a widespread concern about the... Uh, about the, the, the costings and how they've been arrived at here? Um, it's, um, you're absolutely correct that COSLA and um, Social Work Scotland and the National Carers Organisations uh, have um, made those statements. And um, I mean, in, in where we're at in a situation of fiscal constraints and um, really challenging economic climate, then um, it's understandable, absolutely understandable, that that all these all these organisations would would want um, to to have uh, proper costings, fair and proper, transparent costings for uh, the le the legislation, because all agree that um, it's important to um, support adult carers and young carers, um, as of course does the um, the, Sc the Scottish government. Um, before I um, pass over to my colleagues, I'd like to to say that that. These organisations haven't at the moment provided uh, alternatives to the costing set out in the um, financial memorandum, at least not fully, especially around um, unit costs for the adult care support plan and young care statement, and also around um, the demand. Uh, so, um, so across that spectrum, there's not an, an alternative um, positioning of, of the financial estimates. The financial estimates, in terms of how the Scottish Government arrived at the financial estimates. We, COSLA, um, on our behalf, sent out a, a survey form to, to local authorities and we got um, 22 uh, returns, which is a very healthy level of return. We also sent out uh, questionnaires to health boards as, as well. And again, we got a healthy level of, of return and, and on our behalf the Carers Trust and the Coalition of Carers also surveyed carer centres. So there's quite a, um, if I can phrase it this way, a bottom-up approach to estimating um, the, 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 the figures within the, the financial memorandum. Um, you know, as I've said and as I think as all these um, other organisations um, acknowledge, it's very challenging. It's not an exact science. Um, you know, as I've said, it depends on care behaviour. But um, I'm quite you know, happy to, say, to set out how we arrived at the unit costs for 
um, the adult care support plan, which um, Causal and Social Work Scotland and some local authorities have have commented on. I'm also quite ho happy to talk about the removal of the um, substantial regular test, which has been uh, mentioned uh, as, uh, as well. But um, there was a tra transparent process in bu building up the costings for the financial memorandum based on the information um, presented to us through the uh, local authority uh, returns. And, um, and certainly in terms of the the, the unit costs um, for the adult care support plan, then as I say, I'm quite um, happy to, to set that out in detail, but um, perhaps, Julie, do you have anything else to say about the... I would just say, um, I would agree with Maura, we recognise the concerns of COSLA and the other local authorities around the um, accuracy of the estimates, and we recognise that those are our best estimates at this point in time, but we have given a commitment to take on board any new evidence as it comes to light, and we will review that. And what we would propose to do, um, similarly to what we did for the um, Bill for Health and Social Integration, is to create an a expert finance group with representatives from all the key stakeholders, including COSLA, to um, review the costs as we move forward and towards implementation and take on board um, any new evidence that, that they would have. But as things stand, um, the estimates are the best position that we have at this point in time. Okay. Um, it begs the question, what is our best estimate? But we'll leave that just now. Just one further point before I open up to colleagues uh, around the table. In terms of the adult care or support plan, um, you know, that uh, appears to be based on the model of a one-off intervention, but an outcome-based support plan is a process rather than a, a single event. So um, what, what's your view on, on that in terms of how that impacts on the finances, financial, financial um, um, aspects of this bill? A, a fair point that was presented by the national carers organisations and the national carers organisations um, do know um, certainly about how um, current carers assessments are are carried out. Um, certainly a, a carers assessment as the adult care support plan can be a process of building up, building up information, it can be an, an iterative process, it, it can be uh, reviewed um, but, but equally, it can also be quite a, 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 a low profile, if you like, um, form of, of um, carer's assessment in, in that uh, you, you can, it's depend, it really depends on the, the situation of, of the carer and finding out from the carer or the young carer what, what, what is the impact of that the caring is, is having on them and what personal outcomes they would like to achieve to go back to the opening statement that you made at the beginning in order to be able to um, continue caring if that is what carers want to do in good health and to have a, a life alongside caring and equally for young carers but also to uh, have a, a, ch a childhood. So carers' assessments can take many forms and we are certainly aware, especially where there are complex um, needs, complex issues to explore, that a carer's assessment and adult care support plan um, could take um, longer, as, as the national carers' organisations have said. But again, we know from the returns we, we've received and, and from research that it could be a much shorter uh, process because perhaps the the needs are not as, as demanding. In terms then of the unit costs and how the unit costs have been uh, derived, it would be quite a, a difficult um, exercise, quite a challenging exercise and detailed one to try and build up unit costs based on different types of assessment, how many days they're carried out and so on. What, what we do know from the returns is that some assessments are carried out by social workers, some by health professionals, some by social care assistants, some by the voluntary sector. And what a point is made in the financial memorandum that what needs to be looked at is the efficiencies around it. And the unit costs presented in the financial memorandum set out three costs, with 176 being at the, the top end of that, uh, I would um, 
draw attention. I was speaking the other day to um, colleagues uh, in, in London around the estimates for their Im impact assessment on the carers' provisions in the, the Care Act, and the, they um, equally they, they sought returns from local authorities in England around unit costs. Uh, the English unit cost is presented in the financial memorandum as £100. It's now standing at £116 as a median cost, and that's based on returns from 120 authorities out of 152 in England, which is a 79% return rate, which is um, very good indeed. So showing a cost of £116, which should be for... Um, different types of assessment um, compares very favourably indeed or is much lower than, um, than um, the cost or the higher end cost of £176 set out in the financial memorandum. I think that um, in looking at the, again the returns from local authorities and the unit costs for the current carers assessment there were only two authorities out of all the returns we received that presented a unit cost of over £300. There were about four or five that presented unit costs of less than £100, and the rest um, congregated in the middle, if you like, between uh, 100 and um, up to 250 or so. So we derived an estimate of £176. But we do acknowledge that the unit cost um, will be variable, not only depending on um, the iterative process or whether it's a much simpler uh, process, but also on, as I've said, if it's complex needs, more straightforward needs, rurality, um, travelling time, and so on. I would also say that there's, uh, to add to that, that there tends to be some, some local authorities, maybe a few, I don't know exactly how many, are beginning to look at telephone assessments or assessments online. Now, those would only be valid in, in certain circumstances, and you know, you know, carers do value face-to-face -face interventions, um, a, a conversation. Um, one local authority calls their carer's assessment a, a conversation, and another, another calls it a journey, um, and, and a, a quite a number call it a, a carer support plan. So, um, you know, that conversation is valued. But all I'm saying is that it would be difficult to, to say, look across the piece. We've done the best with the information presented. And um, there was a concern that we didn't take account of the, the figures for over 300. As I've said, there was only two at that level. But I think we'd be willing to say, well, despite the fact that the median unit cost in England is £116, that there's merit in considering, because of rurality and other issues, of um, a unit cost um, maybe going upwards towards the £176, but that would be an issue which um, would be helpful to explore further in the finance group that, that Julia has, has stated would, would take place. That comprehensive answer. I'm going to open out a uh, session now to colleagues around the table. The first person to ask questions will be Gavin, to be followed by John. Thank you. Um, first one is, you, in one answer to the convener, you said that other organisations hadn't provided alternative costings. Across the piece. All of the financial memorandum. Quick question. If, if they did so, would that cause you to revisit your figures? Well, I think, um, as, as I said, they hadn't um, provided alternatives across the piece. And I think... Um, Social Work Scotland and, and COSLA said that they, they didn't want to present an alternative at this stage because they felt that wasn't the right thing to do, the appropriate thing to do, because it would present it would present us one set of estimates against another, and that's not the way we want to work. We do want to work t um, together uh, on this, and, and indeed we did you know, present our estimates to COSLA uh, in, uh, at the middle of, of February. Um, I, I'm certainly, um, certainly aware that if there's an adjustment for a number of carers um, coming into the system, then that um, you know, will have an, an, an impact on costs if there's a change in the demand situation, certainly. Um, but given our very uncertain position around trying to estimate demand, then 
I think the Scottish um, government has, has, has certainly done um, the, you know, the best it can do in those circumstances. Can I just add to that? I mean, I think for the purposes of the bill, um, we, we accept the, the, the estimate that we have at the moment. But as I said, as part of this working group, um, as time goes forward and over time, as I say, if we get more robust estimates or if we can get um, more submissions from local authorities um, with sufficient evidence to back that up, then, then we will take that into account and we can look at the position um, that's presented. Okay. Um, so, so you both say there are a huge number of uncertainties with a, a demand-driven uh, service, and I'm sure that's right. So in, in practice, then, let, let's just assume for a second that COSLA turn out to be right. And so some of the estimates, that, the, the more expensive estimates that some local authorities are coming up with turn out to happen in practice, and your estimates do turn out to be um, you know, underestimates to, to a significant degree. Let's just assume that happens. If that happens, is there a Scottish Government commitment to underwrite um, any shortfall, or is, it, is that just tough luck on local authorities if that happens? I think we would look at, again at that evidence. Um, once the, um, the, the carers bill is, is implemented. If there is a significant difference between the estimates and the actual cost, then we will obviously need to look at that again in light of the overall Scottish Government financial settlement and look at the options that we have available to us at that time alongside other policy and legislative commitments. It's maybe a, a question more fairly put to ministers who, who we talk yeah. to. Uh, give confirmation, but I think it's important because if you know the, the convener alluded to it, there is always a difference between what, uh, for example, local authorities might say the cost will be and what Scottish government estimates, and and uh, you know the answer will often always be somewhere in between. But the important question for me is who bears the risk um, on those figures being wrong? Is it the local authority? Um, or is it the Scottish Government? But I'll, uh, that's a question I think I'll put to ministers, and I think you've uh, given an answer on that. Um, can I go into some of the, the detail of the, the, the memorandum? Have you got the financial memorandum handy? OK. Um, if I look at page, it's page 34 on the copy I've got. Uh, it's table three, costs on the NHS. On that table, the first cost YCS recurring is a pretty small one, so I'll skip that. Information and advice service appears to be two million a year, and it doesn't change, but uh, I can sort of understand that. The third one, though, duty to support carers, it's going to be three million pounds per annum in year one, and that doesn't change at all over the, the five year period. Uh, I mean, are you confident there would be no increase in the costs of a duty to support carers? Um, some six six years later, just strikes me as odd. Yes, um, I can explain that um, the two million for information advice and the three million for the duty to support across all the years um, adds up to the five million that's currently available to health boards for carer information strategy funding and. Um, and that funding has been five million per year for the, the last uh, number of years. So arguably these figures um, actually shouldn't be presented in the financial memorandum, I say arguably because the vast majority of duties are on local authorities and um, there's only two duties on health boards. So. Um, but what we've done is because there is so much favourable comment about the impact of a relatively modest sum of five, sum of five million pounds for carer information strategies through health boards, that and they've built up expertise working with the third sector and local authorities over the number number of years. But because there is so much um, very credible information about the impact of that then the decision was taken to include that funding within the financial memorandum and um, to, to recognise the value of what's been achieved so far. So therefore, the two million, and uh, well, you, you um, focused on the duty to support, the three million would be added to the funding that has been attributed to local authorities uh, for, the, um, for the duty to support carers um, as, as set out in the, the, the table on, on the previous page. Okay. Um, you sound fairly confident in that one. Uh, if, we, if we go back 
two pages in, page 32 of the, the memorandum, um, and these are uh, support plan costs. Um, if we look at just maybe the top, uh, the top row there, um, it goes from 17, 18 all the way to 20, to 23. Um, it starts off as a maximum of 1.82 million, increasing year in year to a maximum of 18.86 uh, per year. Um, now you're saying it doesn't increase after that, it's just recurring from 2021, 20, 2022. I mean, is that right? Is this something that once you reach your maximum of say 18.86, it can't increase after that? We would she see that. Answer. At the moment, has been the maximum based on um, the 34% that we would, um, the number of carers that would receive an adult care and support plan by that time. Um, we would see that as a maximum, and if anything, um, that number, in order to maintain that 34%, those numbers could actually start to decline Drop. over the, the latter years. And I think that's part of what we would want the, the expert group to look at is the longer term implications of the bill as well mm -hmm. and how how we would um, look at that over a longer, perhaps five to ten year period. But um, yes, that would be a maximum and could actually reduce, which would free up potential resources to invest in the, the duty to support carers. Sure. OK, um, second question on, on, on that area. The, the causal paper suggests that when, when this was happening south of the border, they assumed the jump from uh, year one uh, to your maximum would happen over a two-year period, and you've assumed it's happening over a five-year period. Um, are you able to explain why why a five-year period is more likely, or has anything happened down south that uh, leads you to think the two-year period was a mistake in the first place? I mean, are you able to ex expand on that? Um, yeah, yes, yes, I, I am. Um, again... Um, COSLA, um, so Short Scotland, others are, are right in that. There's a different time frame in Scotland for the, the build up um, for the adult care support plan compared to the carers' assessment in England. The, the reason is because in England, in proportion to the population, there are more carers' assessments carried out than in Scotland, at least according to the estimates. Um, that we've managed to build up from the local authority returns that we have received. So um, there were 370,000 carers' assessments carried out in England in 2013-14, and that figures from their, their impact ass assessment. 10% of that figure would obviously be um, 37,000 uh, in Scotland carers' assessments carried out, but yet Scotland, according to the estimated figures, doesn't stand anywhere near 37,000 carers' assessments carried out. It's estimated that there are only around about 12,000 mm -hmm. carers' assessments carried out uh, in relation to adults, adult carers across Scotland at the moment. So therefore, in comparison to down south, we're starting from a, an extremely low base. It's true that carers can be assessed with the person that they that they care for as well. There are different types of assessments, but based on carers' ass assessments, it's a very, very low base. Even when we take into account assessment, other types of assessment, including assessment with the care for person, it's still a fairly low base. It doubles from 12,000 to 24,000, but, but still a low, a low base in comparison with, with England. So... Because it starts from a low base, it, would, it means that the, the profile, in, in, in our view, would have to be over a longer period, and it does build up uh, from the later years. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Um, in, terms, in terms of the unit cost for the uh, assessments, I think you've, you've taken the average uh, as being £176. Pounds. Um, although you, in terms of your table, you've kind of put that at the top end. You, you give a low, medium, and high, and, and you've sort of put that one as a high one. You've you've talked to local authorities and drawn an average. I suppose my question is: Is 176 pounds? Is that just splitting the average of local authority A and local authority B, for example, or do you look at the number of assessments within each authority and then average it out? Because if if I mean, I don't know which local authorities are the 260 and the £300 ones, but if they're the local authorities 
with more assessments if they're the larger local authorities, if you like, and the very small local authorities have lower unit costs, then your average might be slightly skewed. I'm just, have you actually taken into account the number of assessments within each local authority, or have you just taken an average for the local authority and, and divided it that way? Well, for each questionnaire return um, that we received, the, um, the unit cost itself wasn't presented. What was presented was um, the number of assessments carried out in a year and then the cost of carrying out those assessments and then we calculated the uh, the average unit cost for each authority um, based on that so doing a, 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 a arithmetic calculation um, so, so it, to that extent it did take account of the numbers of assessments carried out within each, each local authority area okay and, in, and your comparison with the English local authorities, where it was 100 to begin with, and you're now saying it's 116, I mean, are you definitely comparing apples with apples there? Or is there, some, is there something different about those assessments that could make those costs lower? Well, from the information uh, within the impact assessment, uh, we don't have the, um, the full information around the, the English costs, but in, in speaking to colleagues, they... They, they did say that, um, like us, they, they got returns and they got a unit cost for for each local authority area. Um, they said, same as you, uh, our, the unit costs in England varied widely from less than £100 to... Um, and they said, like us, exactly the same as us, there were a few that were um, over £300. Um, I think they, they did some sort of... Uh, waiting um, for according to, to area, so f to that extent it, it could be different, but that was the basis of theirs. So I think it's instructive to, you know, to look at the English costs. There, there may be more, um, I, don't, you know, I, I think the number of complex cases will be similar north and south of the border. There may be issues more around rurality and, and remoteness uh, in Scotland. Okay. And then just the last area to look at, if we can go to page 46 of the financial memo, um, which uh, this is your um, cost of support, and this is your, the, the unit cost of £333 uh, that you talked about. In one of your earlier answers, you, you mentioned the English one was 967 but if you were doing the Scottish one on a on a like-for-like -like basis, it would be closer to 600 um, what, what's the difference between the, the £600 figure that you mentioned and the £333 unit cost that you've used in the financial memo? The £333 unit cost is based on um, Carers Trust research. And it has to be said, there, there isn't a, a huge amount of, of, of research in this area, but it's based on direct support to carers. Now, I think a point was made in one of the responses from one of the national carers organisations that that £333 actually doesn't include short breaks, it includes advocacy, information and advice, emotional support. However, um, however, what we've done, we've, we've costed information and advice separately, so therefore the £333 would, would, would appear to be reasonable. Uh, certainly in comparison with time to live funds, uh, time to live grants, grants that are given directly to, to individuals, individual carers un under the Voluntary Sector Short Breaks Fund, um, those individual grants were, were you know, they were, they, were, they, were, they were varied as you would expect depending on individual circumstances, but the 333 was, was above um, certainly a good level of, of grants that are given under the, the, the time to live fund. So the 333 represents direct support to carers. The £600 uh, figure quoted, £609 figure, and that's the cost of respite care in a care home um, per person. So it would be the care, the, the, the care for person, an older person in a care home, um, and the, the, the carer getting um, a short respite as, as a result of that. Um, 
We've not included it, as I said, at, at the moment because there are challenges around the existing waiving of charges regulations and we want to take stock of that. So there will be a need for further work. But I think it's, it's not right to say that, uh, that the figure down south of £900 is, is directly comparable here. And I think the 333 figure could um, certainly, uh, as an average unit cost, could certainly provide a good level of support to carers. Um, at this point, it might be worth, um, since you uh, referred to this table, it might be worth, and because I've got it in front of me, um, to um, apologise to, um, to the Finance Committee for an error in the, the figures and that Social Work Scotland uh, is indeed right, and we, we value their very careful eye and scrutiny of the figures, that the figure in 2020-21 for £330, uh, I've got it as 24.808. It is indeed 36.288. So we would, uh, we would address, address that and take that into account. Sure, sure. Okay. Just from, from your, the earlier part of your answer, though, it, I mean, is there, you're saying further work's needed and so on to look at um, uh, getting rid of charges and so on, but is, is there any possibility that this 333 unit cost becomes a unit cost of 609? Again, it would be for um, the, the group that, that Julie referred to to, um, to to look at this in, in more detail. Uh, you know, we've done the best with, with what we've got. Um, I've referred to the, the waiving of charges. Um, would you like me to talk a bit about that and why that has an implication around what we're seeing? But, but possibly, yes. I mean, what, what I'm driving at is if, if, if the 333 becomes 609, it effectively doubles the cost of the bill. So I'm just trying to work out, is, is there any risk of that happening? And if so, um, how, how big a risk? It's just trying, as a finance committee, trying to establish... Um, what, the, what the parameters might be. Yeah, well, the type of support to carers um, will vary, um, of course. So the 333, which excludes information and advice, has to be said. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a fair amount um, per, um, per carer who, whose um, needs are eligible um, and who are, who are being supported in, in this way, then it's it's a fair amount. I mean, it could be less than 333. It, it could be more. And this this and and the carers' organisations too. Um, you know, one of their views, and I don't want to put words into into their mouths certainly, but one of the views of the carers' organisations is that we want to see more. Um, you know, person centre type of support, and I refer here to in particular to to short breaks, um, a variety of short breaks, um, something that isn't traditional, uh, or not always. Although some traditional forms forms of respite, if you like, are are, are very relevant, um, and indeed. But to to try and get in that element of of innovation, the type of the the holiday break or or you know even purchasing a greenhouse now that's quoted as um, providing a, a break to some people because it's not seen as traditional respite but you know we know um, you know from feedback from carers they would say that that having this um, sort of facility they can do what they want um, and get time out from caring that's what they want so it doesn't have to be um, within a you know the, the care for a person is, is in a care home but you know your point you know, is, is, is valid. There's such a range of costs. So um, I, 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 I don't think it would be appropriate to say that in all cases, uh, the unit cost would be 600, uh, over £600. Pounds. Um, so that, that, that wouldn't be the case. And again, it's often said that, that carers don't really want, the, want too much. Of course, they want support. They want support in the right way at the right time, which meets their needs and, and, and the needs of the person they're caring for. Come here, thank you. Uh, John, to be followed by Malg. Okay, I mean, I, I think we are kind of going over the same ground uh, a bit, and uh, I think I'm going to be doing that as well, probably, because it does seem to be focused down on some of these issues. Um, I mean, I'm specifically, I'm from Glasgow, so I'm looking at Glasgow's submission, and I, I'm not quite understanding, because you suggested that, although you had... Uh, estimated costs from different organisations and you'd taken an average, 
you hadn't had exactly a specific figure from every local authority. But, I mean, Glasgow specifically says, uh, we estimated that a care assessment in Glasgow cost around £280, uh, and the FM is working the assumption of 72 to 176 and it says for young carers we submit an estimated unit cost of £394. So is that something different they're talking about, or is that like for like we're talking about? How do these figures compare? Um, no, with, well, with regard to adult carers, it, it is really, um, as we've discussed, yes, the response from Glasgow did set out the unit cost of £280, um, as I said, there were two authorities of the responses we received in relation to adults where the cost was over £300. Glasgow was one of the 10 authorities um, which presented costs of between 101 and 299 So, um, you know, the, the, the cost presented by Glasgow was taken into account in working out the figure of £176. And as you answered, Mr. Brown, that would actually have pulled the average up a bit. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I think so. Yes. So, um, therefore, Glasgow cannot do the present assessment for £176. Are, are you saying that they're really they're overdoing it, maybe sending two people along when they should only send one, too much management costs, that kind of thing? Well, I wouldn't say that um, because the, all authorities were were given a brief outline of what would be included within our unit cost and in terms of, of staffing and so on and I, I, you know, I wouldn't want to um, comment in, in, in that negative way on, on Glasgow's costs and, and as I say they weren't, the, uh, they weren't the highest cost but I think because we're presented with such a wide range of unit costs then it is it's, it's challenging to, you know, to, to look at the issues. What, what we I mean, what, what I think what I do know about Glasgow is is that their assessments I think tend to concentrate on those with with those carers with with very intensive caring situations, very difficult situations, and they are carried out by um, by by the social work department, as far as I'm aware. Um, whereas uh, other carers, they go through a self in Glasgow, they go through a self assessment process which is carried out, I think, either wholly or partly by the, the voluntary sector. And, and that would be, um, you know, the, the cost of that wouldn't be as high. And then if the voluntary sector picks up that there are indeed cases that should be referred to social work, they would be referred in that way. As I say, that's my very broad brush understanding of how Glasgow operates. Um, but I certainly wouldn't want to say that they're providing too many social works workers or so on. And what I would say before handing over to, to Julie is, is that we do know that a lot of the, the costs are taken up by, by staffing and that they're, they're sh you know, should look critically um, at, the, at the efficiencies of it. I was just going to add that as, as part of this further work, I think it would be really helpful to look at the average costs submitted by the different authorities and share good practice where we can see you know, where local authorities are able to drive down those costs because obviously we want to do this as efficiently as possible and learn from good practice where we can see that. Yes. I mean, my own perspective is that, yes, I mean, I think Glasgow can be top heavy at times and that they don't use the third sector very well. Uh, on the other hand, efficiency makes me think of Atos and uh, you know, that may be efficient to churn people through and tell them that they're all fit for work. But, um, you know, whether that gives you actually the best assessment or not, I don't know. So I've certainly got concerns in that area. Um, and, and the other point, which we've also just gone on quite a lot about, is this £333. So can you just explain to me, uh, if I haven't understood, uh, we've got a young person caring for a parent or an adult or something. Uh, the £333 will pay for the young person to go to scout camp or guide camp or something like that for a week. Uh, what happens to the older person? Okay. Um, well, there's a, a, a wider uh, issue around that um, regard, regarding who cares for the, 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 the care for person when, when the, in this instance, the young carer is away. I mean, first of all, I, I, mean, I, I should say that the adult carer support plan will be looking at what the personal outcomes are for um, 
sorry, the young carer statement rather, be looking at the, the personal outcomes for the, the young carer and if it's deemed that the young carer, um, that they would benefit from the type of um, um, scout camp intervention you speak about then, you know, then that, that, that would happen. It's seen as a, as a, as a bespoke type of support and then um, providing uh, eligible needs are met. It has to be said bef before that process um, then they would um, that, that, that would be uh, funded in terms of the person that they're caring for um, then there could be a number of situations there because another family member could um, stand in or the carer center as we understand happens works with the local authority to agree an intervention if you look at the young carers festival that happens every year at uh, East Linton. Um, I don't know if any of you have been, it's, it's great fun, but in any event, there are 600 young carers there every year, and, and those 600 ca young carers are away from their parent that they're caring for, or their sibling. In some cases, for the duration, for two days, the, the, the parent um, can be without the young carer's support that they manage in, in other ways. Um, and as I say, in some cases, we know that the carer centre will will provide um, support themselves or will negotiate with the local authority. But certainly replacement care is an issue um, in terms of the, the, the broad policy because, you know, carers, um, in order to get away from the, the caring situation or to, you know, to have a life of their own, in, in some instances, there does need to be replacement care provided but not in all instances so is there any financial provision for that replacement care well this comes back to the waiving of charges issue that i've alluded to uh, on a on a few occasions and if you could um, bear with me just while i outline a bit of the the history because it does does lead up to where i'm i'm getting to is that um the previous public health minister gave a commitment when the self-directed support act bill as it was was going through parliament um, and the sds bill contains a, a contained a power or the act contains a power to support carers and the minister gave a commitment that if um, the power is used then the support that the carer receives charges would be waived because carers are providers of services and should not be charged um, for the services that they provide. So the Scottish Government um, developed regulations and guidance around this waiving of charges, and it was stated that if local authorities use this power um, through Section 3 of the Self-Directed Support Act, um, that, that and going through the process of looking at the CARES assessment and so on, that uh, the charges would be waived. Sorry, waived by whom? Because uh, in, in my scenario, the person who's being cared for goes into the Four Seasons care home in Bailiston mm. and the charge is £600. Now, yeah. Bupa or, or Four Seasons aren't going to waive that. Yeah, it would be by um, the local authority. Now, it could be that the, the charge that would be waived would be if it's a direct short break, like a, a holiday, that that, that that would be waived. Um, but also, so, if um, it, but if waived by whom? By Four Seasons? By the lo by the local authority. But they're not in a local authority home; they're in a private home. Um, okay, um, I don't I, I don't know about that. We have virtually no pr local authority homes. Yeah, I, I don't know about that. But in terms of in terms of if 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 the support was through Section Three, what well, the issue that has arisen um, w with this and the challenge of it. Is, is around replacement care uh, for for um, under under section three of the SDS Act. So what COSLA and some local authorities said to us, they said, um, "I'm sorry, but it's not possible to say whether replacement care benefits uh, the carer or the cared for person because if it benefits the 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 carer." then the charges would be waived. If it, if it benefits the cared for person, then normal charging would, would apply. So, so charging would be waived in relation to where it supports the carer. Um, now, some 
you could say, well, you know, we understand this issue. It's, it's, it's difficult to, to judge sometimes. Is the replacement care benefiting the carer or the cared for or indeed both the carer and the cared for? In some instances, it might be a bit more straightforward. If the replacement care is a daycare centre and the cared for person is going there to promote their own independence, um, and, and to, you know, to have something good to do within the daycare centre, you can say that's supporting the cared for person and therefore normal charging would apply. But uh, it, is cha it is challenging and difficult to know whether replacement care is for the... Yes, I mean, I do take that distinction that as to who the replacement care, but I mean, I, I think my fundamental point is that somebody is going to engage have a cost here. And it might be if the person stays at home and just gets a few hours extra visits, then in Glasgow's case, that's going to be Cordia or going to be paying somebody to do that. Somebody's got to pay that wage. If it's in a proper care home, it's going to be the 600 to the private company or whatever it is. I'm still struggling, uh, about how, you know, I'm struggling to understand who's paying that bill. Well, if it's within the, the local authority, it'd be the local authority that waive the charges. I'll, I'll, we'll come back to you on the, the question you raised about private care homes. But leading up to the, the issue and the, the challenge, we've had a number of discussions with COSLA, uh, with, with, with a few local authorities, with the national carers' organisations, to try and deal with these issues regarding waiving of charges and the issues that have arisen. And we're not yet at a position of knowing what we will be doing. So, and you know, ministers will need to, you know, to take a final decision around it in, in order to resolve this, this kind of impasse, if you like, mm -hmm. um, because not many authorities are using the power to support carers under the SDS Act. Now, that might be because of the uncertainty over the charging issue, or it might be because the Self-Directed Support Act is relatively new in any event. Um, so there could be an, a, a whole host of, of, of reasons but it's certainly an issue that needs to be, um, that we are looking okay, well, at. I mean, I appreciate your answer. I just, I, I remain convinced that there are costs out there that I'm not seeing in the FM. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that, uh, Deputy Convener. Our next colleague to ask questions will be Malcolm, to be followed by Mark. <coughs> if I could just, I'm just going to ask about something else, but if I can just pick up this, this issue. First, um, you, you're going to come back to us on the scenario about £600 in a care home, but... Uh, are you assuming that there is an issue there and that that would be support for a carer rather than support for a care for a person? Because if it's support for a care for a person, there's no issue. They'll just have to pay the £600. That's, that's right. And that is a challenge because some local authorities are saying that they cannot operate the waiving of charges regulations because they, just, they simply cannot say um, whether the support is primarily for the carer or for the cared for person. And if that's the case, um, uh, some local authorities are saying that, then, then, then there is a challenge um, for them. I mean, you could say that arguably if, if it's directed through the carer's assessment, then it's support for the, the carer. But, you know, some local authorities have said that there might be a pressure on practitioners to say that the support... Um, is, is for the cared for person so that they can um, so that they can have charges applied uh, or that there might be pressure from carers to say well, it's definitely support for the carer um, so, so that they can get that um, support without you know without without paying a, a charge for it so so we understand the complexities and the the, the difficulties around it and we are you know as I say, we've had a number of meetings with causal local authorities and national cares organisations to try and see a path, a path forward on this. And because of that, because it's unresolved at the moment, therefore the financial memorandum doesn't um, capture sort of any costs around replacement care. So will there, will there be new regulations connected with this bill or will there just be new regulations to replace the ones from the self-directed support bill? Well, a decision um, hasn't been um, made at, at, the, at the moment. Um, COSLA have said they would like the existing regulations to be changed, uh, but 
we're not able to do that at the moment because we haven't agreed a way forward. It may be that the existing regulations would stay in place until the bill is commenced and then there would be um, different regulations depending on the way forward that's agreed, but a decision um, just hasn't been reached. So currently, uh, local authorities are working with the existing regulations, and there is a small, there is a handful of, of local authorities that are saying, yes, um, uh, we want to support carers in, in this, this way, and we, we will work with the, the power in the self directed support act, we'll work with uh, the regulations, and we'll, we'll waive the charge for carers, and we'll support carers. And there are others that are saying it's just too difficult um, and there are others that are saying, actually, we don't need to use these regulations at all because we're supporting carers via carer centres in our locality, and that's working well. So, there, so it's, it's a very sort of um, difficult, complex so, so do you envisage a supplementary financial memorandum as part of this bill, or will it not be resolved within that? Or? I think it, um, yes, it would, it would need to be resolved. So I, I think we would, we would envisage a, a supplementary um, memorandum to, um, to take account of the issues. Yeah. So, so, so you think? So you'll have to resolve it with, with COSLA within the next few weeks or months. Yes, that's 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 the case. Um, yes. Which, in a kind of way, is connected with the main question I wanted to ask, because you know, looking at the the costings, I mean, the overwhelming bulk of the costings arise from the um, adult carer support plans and even more from the direct support to carers. And COSLA, interestingly, say about this, and I'm quoting, they're basically highlighting the tension as they see it between them, and they say, within the context of a finite resource being made available under the Carers Bill, there is the concern, therefore, that resources which could have been made available for direct support are instead required to be diverted to assessment. So that last bit relates to their scepticism about the 34%, I imagine. So that will have to be demand-led. So if that does prove to be a higher percentage, the local authorities will have to respond. But I suppose, and this is where I don't know the detail of the bill well enough, is there, in fact, a lot of flexibility around the support that must be provided? Uh, or, you know, in other words, are there... Are there sort of national criteria around that or are there just local criteria which could vary quite a lot between different local authorities and therefore if they, if they didn't have, you know, if they had to spend more on the assessments, could they within this legislation just take the money from the, uh, from, from, from the direct support um, resources, as it were, that they'd set aside? Well... Uh, the, 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 we would we would hope that the um, sufficient resources are provided for assessment and or for the adult care support plan and young care statement and sufficient for um, for supporting carers themselves that that meet the, elig the, the eligibility criteria and um, the local eligibility criteria that that would be determined. Uh, I think the point uh, that, that COSLA uh, and, and a few others are making is that they feel that there's a, a disproportionate emphasis on assessment as, as opposed to support. And um, there's a scenario envisaged with the, with the assessment consuming um, resources without any good outcome, if you like. Um, the, the position was taken that, that the adult care support plan would be and the young carer statement would be available to all um, carers, adult carers and young carers, that, it was, that that was very much the way forward. And it, it doesn't mean to say that, that resources are being spent in the wrong way, if I can put it that way, because there is evidence, research evidence, and I, and I, I can you know, refer to um, the committee to research carried out by Midlothian Council um, together with with vocal the local carers organisations, that assessment is extremely valuable if it's carried out properly and in the right way, and that carers will feel supported through an empathetic and outcome-based assessment in itself, that the carer, if they have, haven't been listened to, they value the assessment in the first instance, and, and certainly that research points to, to that. So the the the, me the memorandum sets out the, fin the, the estimates of, of the finances for, for the adult carer support plan and the young carer's statement. 
uh, and then for the information and advice, um, because the process through the bill is that, um, that through the adult care support plan, there's provisions in the bill that then look at uh, whether the needs of the carer, eligible needs could be met by information and advice services. And we know that, again, that carers value information and advice um, or by general services in the community. If their needs cannot be met in that way, then it goes on to the duty to support and then looking at the um, kind of bespoke targeted support uh, according to the eligibility criteria. So, um, yeah, I mean, in terms of the 34% the of, of carers uh, um, having a an adult carer support plan that is a, a steady build up to reach that that figure um, from quite a low base at, at the moment and you know the estimates were made on 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 that i don't know if you want to comment fee on the health and social care experience survey and and the you know the, the numbers of carers that are feeling supported at the moment and so on i mean i, I suppose i suppose just put it in general terms i mean <coughs> If a financial memorandum is an underestimate for some legislation, well, basically the money will just have to be found for somewhere. But I suppose the point I'm making more generally is if the financial memorandum is wrong here, will it in fact just be the carers who suffer because there's so much flexibility around the criteria for support that in fact um, you know, there wouldn't actually be an implication for public expenditure. It would just mean that they didn't get the kind of support that you, th you would like them to have, as it were. Well, certainly, you know, the financial envelope is, is important here and the, the local authorities will draw up their local eligibility criteria, um, certainly having regard to the amount of resources that they have. I think, you know, that would be incumbent upon them to, to, to do so. But, you know, that's sort of, you know, normal process, if, if you like, to take account of the resources that they have, um, it wouldn't be putting carers, if you like, through an adult carer support plan, a young carer's statement, and then to sort of leave them hanging, if you like. There, there, there's resources going into information and advice, there are resources for, um, for, for the, the duty to support, but certainly local authorities would have to take account of, of, the, finan of the resources that they have available and, uh, and, and to look at the, the, the thresholds for support. So I suppose they could give them crudely £100 rather than £300 if, in, in terms of the legislation that would not be breaking the law kind of thing. Well, the local eligibility criteria that have been drawn up have got to be drawn up in a, in a transparent way and they've got to be published. There's got to be involvement of, of carers and young carers in, in drawing it up. So it, would, it has to be a transparent, um, open process with, with local, account, local democratic accountability. But it, it, it wouldn't be breaking the law, I, would, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, think, if that, if that was the case. Okay, well, finally, I mean, the, the section on savings is really interesting, but I mean, you haven't really factored any of that in. Is that just sort of mood music about potentially there might be savings? But... Yeah, well, there's, there, there is some ev ev research evidence, that, and I think it's presented in the policy memorandum as well, that by supporting carers, um, and especially through early intervention pre preventative support, that there are savings to um, health and social care and the policy memorandum quotes three sources of, of that evidence and based on, on English research. Mm -hmm. So, but they're, 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 I think it's acknowledged really across the piece that there needs to be more work done in, in that way. But certainly a lot of the anecdotal information is if carers are supported in the right way, that that will save the care for a person being admitted to hospital or other institutional care and it will save carer breakdown so you know there will be savings and and, and but again you know as, a, as an area that's ripe for further um, evaluation and research and the financial memorandum also um, refers to um, potential savings through carers remaining in employment rather than giving up employment again based on a um, on on some research carried out uh, down down south and, and making some broad brush estimates but the financial memorandum does acknowledge that those estimates you know are are broad brush okay.
Okay, thanks very much. Okay, thank you. You marked before by Richard. Uh, th thank you, Kenner. I'll try and be brief. Um, the uh, you've mentioned a couple of times about research and about particularly in relation to the issue of respite and short breaks. It strikes me that local authorities ought to maintain a list, if you will, of who the people or organisations that provide respite and short breaks for them are and how much it costs them to provide that. So I, I, I struggle with the idea that there isn't available data out there as to how much it costs for a local authority to provide respite and short breaks. So did, did you attempt to get that information direct from local authorities rather than relying on the carers' trust research that you've mentioned? Um, no, as, as, as the um, direct answer to that, there, there, there isn't a, a duty. The, the £333 covers all different types of, of support. There isn't a duty in the bill um, around short breaks to provide short breaks. So therefore we looked at you know the different types of support in the round. Whether local authorities have that information or not, I, I do not know. But certainly in terms of they certainly have information about respite weeks because the Scottish Government collects from local authorities data on respite weeks every year and that data is published in the autumn time. So there is data about respite weeks. I don't think it covers the, the cost of it um, myself, but but you know it's again it's it's worthy of um, it's, it's, it's worth, certainly worthy of, of further exploration. It just, it just I mean I appreciate there's not a duty within the legislation, but at the same time um, you would have to factor in an assumption that a a number of assessments will identify short breaks or respite as being appropriate support for individuals. So while there's not maybe a duty, it's it, it's only fair to assume that that is going to arise and therefore it would be good to have an idea of what the likely costs of that are going to be and whether the assumptions that are made in the financial memorandum would be sufficient. Because one of the concerns that's raised by the national carers organisations is that if the financial memorandum's numbers are insufficient, their concern is that what you will see is amendments to local eligibility criteria which will raise the threshold for receipt of support and will exclude a large number of carers potentially from that support simply because the, the funding that is available would not be able to provide the support required. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you would recognise as a concern? Uh, yes, do um, recognise it uh, as as a concern, and I think the carers organisations and Share Care Scotland made the point that the resources were um, heavier in the, the the later years for the duty to support compared to the earlier years, and that in the earlier years in particular there might be an issue around short breaks, not so much in the the later years of the financial. Uh, memorandum, and I think you know that point is valid. Um, certainly, um, as I say, there's you know the the, the finance committee, the finance uh, group that's being set up would look at that, and I think the point you raised about you're know, saying surely local authorities would have information about the, the costs is, is really valid and something that we'd want to um, look at further. And you know I know as well that there is a concern that um, the the respite weeks. Um, actually has, has gone down between years. So there's a concern, there is a concern um, from the National Cares organisations that at least some local authorities are not providing you know, respite weeks uh, to, in order to, to, to meet you know, adequate numbers of respite weeks in order to meet needs. So it's, it certainly is, a, is a, a, an issue. Um, there is the Voluntary Sector Short Breaks Fund. It's um, a modest sum of, of three million pounds. It's not factored into the financial memorandum, but you know, I think ministers would would want to look um, positively around um, the future future of the short breaks fund as as well. Um, so that's another issue. And again, the um, issue around replacement care that's that's sitting there at the moment because of the waiving of charges issue 
is, 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 is relevant too. I mean, perhaps it's also worth making the, the point, it's not directly relevant to short breaks, but it's, it's, it's relevant to the, the wider picture, is that the resources that local authorities currently spend on, directly on supporting carers, well, we don't have that actual figure because we didn't get 32 responses to the questionnaire and some of the responses didn't um, set out the figures. But for those we have, um, for about 12 authorities, there's over £5 million being spent on direct support to carers from local authorities. Uh, so that, includes, um, that will include short breaks. Now, the financial memorandum um, didn't, didn't take that off um, it, you know, it didn't take it off, so it's there. So there, there is existing funding of local authorities. So, I mean, arguably, arguably, you know, the, the Scottish government is being generous and leaving that level of funding there. It's also apparent from the questionnaire returns, who asked for the amount of funding spent on indirect support to carers, which can include uh, respite for the cared for person. It can include. Um, equipment and adaptations uh, and so on, we asked for that figure and from the returns we got, the figure came to um, £40 million spent on that type of support. Now, that's only for a certain number of local authorities and certainly we, it, it, we wouldn't want to say that is all, all for indirect support to, to carers, but a proportion of it will be and that's um, within the system as well. So, you know, that carries on, um, as does the Integrated Care Fund, which whose last year of the Integrated Care Fund um, coincides with the first year of introduction or of commencement, or roughly, as far as we know, of commencement of the, of the Carers' Bill. And again, although there's no ring fencing for the Integrated Care Fund, again, we know from submissions to the Scottish Government from partnerships that almost all uh, local authorities, not all, but almost all local authorities are saying, yeah, we're going to spend resources on carers because we because we value the support that, that carers are providing. So there's that wider picture, but and, and that's the wider context in terms of the, the overall resourcing. But certainly the point you make about short breaks, eligibility, um, and the pressing down is, is valid and one we would want to consider more widely within that wider context of all the funding. Okay. Um, the uh, Social Work Scotland have raised a concern around the uh, the use of the average, uh, the £176 average, as the top level number within the financial memorandum, because obviously if it's the average, it's not the top um, across Scotland. So um, it, it, can, can you give an indication as to why you put that as the high level when there are obviously, I mean, the, the Deputy Convener has highlighted Glasgow City Council, where other local authorities have given figures that are well in excess of £176 per unit cost. Yes, and it was the minority of local authorities that gave a, a unit cost in excess of £176. The reasons that the that unit costs for the care support plan was set out in that way was to give a flavour to the Finance Committee that assessments can be carried out in different ways. So the lowest one of 72, which wasn't actually the lowest because we took out of the equation the, the, low, the, the, the lowest and the, the highest because those were at the extremities. Um, but to give an indication that assessments can be carried out in, in different ways, and I've mentioned telephone assessment and so on, but you know, the 176 it was presented as the average across a good number of, of local authorities, and there are ones at, at the higher end. So, so yes, you know, I understand Social Work Scotland saying, well, you know, you've you've not presented those higher ones. That's you know, that's, that 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 is the case. Um, but there, you know there would appear to be good reason for for that, and especially given what we know about you know the cost of assessment down south as well. So, but it is something that would be looked at, considered further. Okay, um, one one last question. Um, Glasgow City Council in their um, submission uh, raised some concerns around the use of a three-year 
period as the the sort of the, the length of time that people normally would care for um, and they've raised concerns around um, if you have a child with complex needs then it's going to be more than three years that, that an individual is caring for well, where where did that three year figure come from and what was it based on I think that relates to the um Again, the the work around the three hundred and thirty three pounds that was taken on a, a sort of three year episode of of caring, um, if you like. But yes, it is recognised that, that that carers can care so for it, much it, longer it, than it, that. It, is that merely a case of something being lost in translation by, yes. by Glasgow City Council? Then, is yeah, it? Yeah, yes. Okay. It doesn't mean that that carers would would care for three years and that's it. Although, although some would, but 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 clearly that's not the case. It's for each. It's for each um, £333 unit cost every three, every year. OK, thank you for clarifying. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. I'll try and be brief. I just want to reflect on what some of the other members have raised around the, the concerns um, regarding the allocation of costs for replacement care. Because isn't it the case if, some, if a carer is allocated at £333 in terms of support, but there isn't a replacement care package in place, that rendered because of the problems over waiving charges, that renders the duty to support I mean, either either meaningless or at least uh, severely impaired in terms of its effect. And this is why the issue needs to be resolved um, in time for stage two, because it is very likely that um, a stage two amendment to the bill uh, would be considered. Um, so you know that's why you know the waiving of charges is there as an outstanding issue. Yeah, and but just to get a, a, a sense of the extent and importance of, of that issue, I mean, isn't the reality that the cost of replacement care could be the major cost of this bill, the major cost impact on government councils? And as it stands, it's not in the financial memorandum. No, it's. I mean, you're right. It's it's not in the financial memorandum for the the you know the reasons I've I've um, stated. And if you do want to put a cost on replacement care, then it could be in the region of round about a present cost thirty million pounds across Scotland. Now now because of the issues that is for could support the cared for person or could be primarily for the cared for person and it could be primarily for the carer. Or it could be for both, you know, of benefit to the carer and the cared for person. So, you know, those challenges of of categorising replacement care, um, they, they, as I say, they are they are they are challenges. But if you've got an estimate of thirty million pounds already, why wasn't that included in some form in the in the financial memorandum as it stands? You, you, even saying that it was dependent on negotiations with Cosler. Because. That figure was worked out fairly recently after the financial memorandum was um, submitted. It's, it's not meaning to, um, you know, not to be straightforward about it, but, but that's the case. And also because the waiving of charges issue is outstanding. And, you know, I think it's fair that a further financial memorandum should be presented. But as I say, it wouldn't be fair to present a, a figure either of, of, of uh, well, it probably wouldn't be appropriate to present a figure of, of £30 million if it had been known, because, I say, some, some of that could... The replacement care could certainly be of, of, of prime ben benefit to the care for person uh, rather than the carer. Leave it at that just now, Convener. I think there's huge questions in some of that. For the well, I mean, uh, thank you very much to committee uh, members for their questions, and thank you for the response we've received. However, I, th I do think we're going to need some clarification for the Minister on some of the issues that are actually being raised uh, here today. I'm therefore going to write uh, this afternoon to the Minister and seek a response prior to consideration of our own report, which is due to go to the uh, League Committee back on 27th of May. I think there's a lot of questions I think colleagues still want to answer and we may have to in fact revisit this uh, at some point in the near future. So uh, that being said, I'd like to draw this uh, session to a close and thank you uh, for, your, for your answers today. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much.